This is AMTV in colour. Hello there everyone, and welcome to the third full part of our series looking at the history and impact of Doctor Who ratings. If you haven't seen the first two compilation edits, I highly recommend that you check them out. In them we took a look at both the William Hartnell years and the Patrick Troughton years of Doctor Who, and see how the ratings rise and fall throughout the 1960s. But now, as this is part three, we move on to the third Doctor, John Pertwee. So sit back, relax, and join me once again, because since this video is dedicated to the era of John Pertwee, we must start in Season 7. It's the early days of 1970, and as the British public waved goodbye to the psychedelic 60s and ushered in the vibrant new decade, those who were fans of Doctor Who had a lot to look forward to. Season 6 ended both Patrick Troughton's time as the second Doctor, as well as the black and white era of the show. Burned out after three years of near constant production, Troughton soldiered on, delivering us some of the best and also debatably some of the worst stories of the show's history thus far. When John Pertwee was announced to become the third Doctor, in the summer of 1969, this also came with several new changes to the programme's format and scheduling. To start with, since the show began, each season lasted roughly 9-10 to 10 months each year, with a production schedule that barely ever stopped. Having seen the damage the gruelling workload had on the ill William Hartnell, and how it wore down Patrick Troughton, the new Doctor's first run of adventures would now only occupy 6 months of the viewing public's time, comprising of just 4 stories. Secondly, as established in the final moments of the War Games, the Doctor was to be exiled to Earth, being unable to operate the TARDIS, or leave the one space and time that the Time Lords had banished him to. Finally, Doctor Who would now be made and transmitted in colour, despite less than 5% of the British public owning a colour TV set. So why even make that jump? Well, the BBC had been aiming to move to full-time colour broadcasting for some time. BBC Two, a channel which had only launched in 1964, made that full-time colour jump in 1967, serving almost as a testing ground so the BBC could perfect the service and iron out any technical bugs for when BBC One would undergo the same fate. Sporadic colour broadcast did occur on BBC One, but it wasn't until the 15th of November 1969 that the flagship channel, along with its main rival ITV, would switch to a full-time colour broadcast system. As people were still wary about upgrading to a colour set, as they were radically more expensive and would mean a more costly licence fee, the BBC needed to offer some stellar programming, shows that would convince people to make that jump, and it turns out that one of the programmes to spearhead this motif would be Doctor Who. The first story from Season 7 is Spearhead from Space. Whilst the new Doctor recovers from his regeneration, an alien intelligence is planning on utilising plastics to achieve its aim of planet-wide conquest. This story is comprised of four episodes, which began airing on the 3rd of January 1970 and concluded on the 24th of the same month. Here are the individual viewing figures for all four episodes, and what a good way to kick things off. All four episodes sit comfortably in the 8 million range, a massive improvement from the War Games, where no episodes were able to even meet that mark. Clearly viewers were intrigued to see the normally comedic Pertwee in action as the new Doctor, plus the return of Lethbridge, Stewart and Unit. But what else influenced these numbers? Well for one, in terms of promotion, in the week of Episode 1's transmission, John Pertwee was shown in full colour glory on the front cover of the Radio Times. This may not seem like much today, but keep in mind back in the pre-internet era, TV listings magazines like the Radio Times were seen as not only the key way for viewers to learn about upcoming programmes, but also for said programmes to get a good dash of promotion and exposure in the process. The full colour photo only emphasises how colourful this new Doctor and season will be, further encouraging viewers that a colour set was worth the extra cop. Secondly, exactly one week before Episode 1 went out, on the 27th of December 1969, right after a showing of Star Trek, a special trailer for the story was aired. Doctor Who rarely got such trailers back in its early years, so again, to promote the story, as well as the new colour era of Doctor Who in this new way, was a smart tactic. Another factor we must take into account is competition. Discounting its sister channel, BBC Two, BBC One had only one major competitor at the time, that being ITV. Across its several regions, the other side decided to either show repeats against Doctor Who, such as medical sitcom Doctor in the House, or air American imports, such as Tarzan, Garrison's Gorillas, and Cowboy in Africa. All of these did little to dent the new Doctor's impact, further helping Spearhead in the ratings. In terms of audience response, viewers of the time immediately took to Pertwee as the new Doctor, far quicker than they had arguably done with Patrick Troughton. While some younger viewers were disappointed to learn the new season would be set exclusively on Earth, 
it was clear that the choice of actor, the shift to more mature storylines and action sequences, plus the move to colour, was working. Overall, this story attracted an average of 8.2 million viewers, an absolutely huge 3.3 million increase from the War Games, which had only aired six months earlier. With the arrival of the new Doctor and the return of the popular Lethbridge Stewart and Unit, higher viewing figures could have almost been expected, but for them to jump so rapidly is a remarkable show of strength for Doctor Who, who months previously was narrowly avoiding the chopping block from the heads of the BBC. We also have some repeat data for you, and I mean a lot of repeat data. Firstly, the story was repeated between the 9th and 30th of July 1971. There was talk of potentially moving Doctor Who to a Friday night slot for when its ninth series arrived in January of 1972. So Spearhead was selected as a test pilot for this, in the summer months when Doctor Who was typically now off the air. Here are those repeat viewing figures, and it seems like the Friday night experiment didn't work out so well. Despite airing at a prime time slot of 6.20pm, we can see that no episode cracked 4 million viewers, with an overall average of 3.3 million viewers, nearly 5 million less than the original broadcast. This could partly be down to the fact that the story was only a year old at this point, so perhaps viewers weren't too enthused about re-watching Spearhead when compared to, say, A Hartnell or Troughton Tale. Secondly, airing in July, this almost guaranteed figures would be lower anyway, with British summertime providing audiences with a strong pull away from their telly screens. Our second lot of repeat data takes us to the year 1999, and to the BBC's secondary channel, BBC Two. Spearhead from Space was selected to be the beginning of a run of Doctor Who repeats, with the first two episodes airing on the 16th of November 1999, with the remaining two airing in subsequent weeks. Here are the viewing figures for the repeat, and whilst they may look worse than the 1971 re-airing, by 1999 there were literally hundreds of channels for people to choose from, and Doctor Who wasn't airing new episodes. The show was considered dead by a great many people, so the fact that this repeat still attracted an average of 2.61 million viewers is testament to the show's lasting legacy and impact on pop culture. Spearhead from Space is a great introduction to this brand new era of the show. John Pertwee absolutely steals the show as the third Doctor, and even though he takes some time to finesse and develop the character, the heavy use of the Brigadier and Unit, the introduction of the likeable Liz Shaw, and the absolute terror of the Autons more than help carry this tale across its four episodes. It's also the only classic Who story you can enjoy in true HD, as thanks to a BBC strike, the production was shot entirely on film instead of videotape. This HD version was released on Blu-ray in 2013, with the limited edition Steelbook being released in 2060. You can also enjoy the story as a Target book, released in 1974, and various audio releases of said book. Or you can enjoy it via two different VHS releases from 1988 and 1995 respectively, or via DVD either watching the original release from 2001 or its re-release in 2011, as part of the Mannequin Mania box set. The Autons proved popular and instantly memorable, and it wouldn't be long before audiences would see them again. But more on that when we get there. I don't even know your name. Uh, Smith. Dr. John Smith. The second story from Season 7 is Doctor Who and the Silurians. The Doctor and Unit are summoned to a subterranean research centre beneath Wenley Moor after it experiences mysterious power losses. The answer to the mystery lies in the nearby cave network, where an ancient race of creatures is returning to life, the Silurians. This story is comprised of seven episodes, which began airing on the 31st of January 1970 and concluded on the 14th of March. Here are the individual viewing figures for all seven episodes, and I would argue that this is another pretty strong showing. We have a new high for the season, with episode 1 attaining 8.8 .8 million, and even the lowest viewed episode, that being episode 6, still pulled in 7.2 million viewers. So even though not all of the episodes had over 8 million as Spearhead did, to not fall below 7 million over a 7 week period is certainly impressive. In terms of competition, it was virtually the same that Spearhead had faced in January, a mixture of repeats or American imports, none of which took a massive chunk of the audience away from the Doctor and Unit. The show itself was back in the 5.15pm slot, the time it had originally began airing back in November of 1963. There wasn't the same level of promotion that Spearhead had received, but with another new iconic monster being introduced, the Silurians, plus the continued development of the Doctor's exile amongst the unit backdrop, only helped audiences warm to the new format the show was going for. Reviews of the time were favourable, citing that Doctor Who was definitely becoming more adult-themed in nature, almost becoming like a successor to the Quatermass serials of the 1950s. And while some parents complained that the show was now too horrific for children, the overall reaction was a positive one. 
By the time Episode 7 aired, it's arguable that most of the millions tuning in had accepted and embraced John Pertwee as the Doctor. Also, for those wondering, this story was meant to be titled and transmitted as simply The Silurians, but due to various errors, it went out with the Doctor Who and prefix slapped onto it, and it remains the only example of this in the show's near 60-year TV history. Overall, this story attracted an average of 7.7 .7 million viewers, a half a million decrease from the previous story. It's certainly a strong average for a seven-episode story, as we've seen from the longer stories of the 60s, it's a lot easier for figures to drop over time if audiences aren't enjoying or connecting with the story. Clearly, the Earthbound format of the season was working, and audiences were warming to the new Doctor and his support team enough to keep tuning in. Doctor Who and the Silurians is a wonderful adventure to dive into. Despite being seven parts, it rarely ever gets boring. The Silurians here are a fascinating species to learn about, and there are some great plot points and action sequences, and the new Doctor's personality, particularly railing against authority, is on full display here, and Pertwee sells it completely. If you wish to enjoy this story today, you can in the written world via a Target book release from 1974, or as an audio reading of said book from 2007. If you wish to see the story in its original televised form, there's a VHS release from 1993, which was the first time all seven episodes were available in colour since the original broadcast, or as part of the Beneath the Surface box set, released on DVD in 2008. Like the Autons, the Silurians were another new popular monster for the show to notch on its belt, and whilst they specifically wouldn't be seen again for another 14 years, their influence and their reptilian peers would be seen much sooner. Oh, oh, wait! 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 Unless you Silurians tell us what you want, the humans will destroy you! The third and penultimate story from Season 7 is the Ambassadors of Death. Contact has been lost with Mars Probe 7. When the vessel sent to recover the crew returns to Earth, the astronauts are kidnapped. Liz detects high levels of radiation in the empty space capsule, and the Doctor can only conclude that the occupants are not human. This story is comprised of seven episodes, which began airing on the 21st of March 1970 and concluded on the 2nd of May. Here are the individual viewing figures for all seven episodes, and things are certainly a bit more jumbled. We have a new high for the season, with episode 4 reaching 9.3 million viewers, which is the highest for an individual episode since the opening part of The Crotons in December of 1968. However, we also have to note a new low for the season too, with episode 7 dropping to 5.4 million. Not the best rating, but what could cause Season 7 to slip from the comfortable 8 million position it began with? Well, it certainly wasn't on the promotional front, as just like Spearhead from Space, the Ambassadors of Death received a special trailer broadcast immediately after the final episode of The Silurians. This trailer is intensely atmospheric, and even though its original colour presentation is available on the DVD release, I find the black and white version, which is present on the VHS release, even more terrifying. It's one of the earliest examples we have of one of these trailers for Classic Who, and I can only imagine how exciting this must have been for viewers in 1970. Competition continued to be a non-threat for Doctor Who, with many of the same programmes still going against it, but we do have some small time slot differences. Episode 4 in particular went out half an hour later than planned due to an overrun of the FA Cup final, and it's the football-loving audience who could arguably be responsible for that episode's higher ratings of 9.3 million. As for the 5.4 million figure for Episode 7, there is no one clear reason for this sharp decline, However, airing in early May, a time when warm weather begins to pick up, it could have just been one of those odd occasions where many families were out doing other things instead of watching some telly. In terms of reviews, many were now starting to compare Doctor Who to the recently launched Doomwatch series, that also aired on BBC One. Debuting in February of 1970, this sci-fi drama was clearly aimed at a more adult demographic than Doctor Who, which was still frequently cited as a children's programme. Whilst there may be similarities, Doctor Who's more mature, gritty, earthbound tone was still proving popular amongst the majority of the viewing public. One such detractor, however, was William Hartnell, the first Doctor himself. In an interview with the Daily Mirror, Hartnell talked about the show. It's too adult. It's meant for children, not grown-ups. There are lots of things you could learn from it now to start a major war. I've stopped watching. So have a lot of children. That's what I hear. Also, a few interesting bits of trivia, in a story focused around astronauts going missing in space, it's quite miraculous that as the Doctor feverishly worked to bring the astronauts back to Earth, NASA scientists were also doing the same thing, trying to bring back the crew of Apollo 13 back home after a major disaster, a task they only just managed to accomplish. Furthermore, this story had one of the most unique title sequences in all of Doctor Who. Ah! 
Overall, this story attracted an average of 7.3 million viewers, a 0.4 drop from the previous story, sadly continuing the downward trend of story averages for Season 7. Having said that, a 7.3 million average is a very respectable one, especially for a seven-part story going out in 1970. And whilst the 5.4 million rating for Episode 7 is eerily reminiscent of the later part of Season 6, overall, Ambassadors did a fine job in keeping people's attention. I've always loved this story. The plot is wonderful, the performances are sublime, and it's genuinely tense in several moments, with some of the best cliffhangers of Pertwee's era. For some, it may be overly long and be filled with needless padding, but for me, I absolutely adore every minute of this Earthbound adventure. If you wish to experience it via alternative media, you can read the Target book from 1987, or listen to the television soundtrack from 2009. In the visual medium, we have the 2002 VHS release, where roughly half of the story is in restored colour, the other half remaining in black and white. But now we also have the DVD release from 2012, where thanks to improvements in restoration technology, we now have a version of Ambassadors of Death that is completely in colour. However, if you can, I would recommend watching all of this story in black and white. It's wonderfully eerie and atmospheric, and only enhances all of the dramatic moments in this seven-part masterpiece. Masterpiece being my choice of words for it anyway. I don't know what we brought down in Mars Probe 7, but it certainly wasn't human. The fourth and final story from Season 7 is Inferno. A top-secret drilling project, led by the obsessed Professor Stallman, is on the verge of penetrating the Earth's crust. A trip to an alternative reality gives the Doctor a glimpse of the catastrophe that will be unleashed. This story is comprised of seven episodes, which began airing on the 9th of May 1970 and concluded on the 20th of June. Here are the individual viewing figures for all seven episodes and, oh dear, things have really taken a tumble for the worst. The highest viewing figure is episode four, which only managed to pull in six million viewers. All of the remaining episodes place in the five million range besides episode three, which falls to a new low of 4.8 million. So despite this story being debatably one of the greatest Doctor Who tales ever, what on earth happened to warrant these lower ratings? Well, the most obvious factor is the time of year in which the stories were transmitting. Beginning in May and lasting through June, with summertime beginning, the downward trend in viewing figures across all channels and programs began to take effect. Competition didn't really play into this, as it was mostly the same stuff the previous three stories went up against. Also, and this is just a theory, but after two seven-part stories, it could be argued that audiences were beginning to tire of adventures set across such a long span of time. What adds to this theory is the fact that Inferno was, and still is to date, the last seven-part story in Doctor Who's history. While stories of that length are fun to watch in retrospect, I can imagine that three of them in a row for a 1970 audience may have been seen as a bit too much. Furthermore, younger audiences were becoming more vocal about their disappointment that the Doctor was no longer travelling in time and space, but was stuck to solving problems just on Earth. However, the senior members of the BBC board were overall happy with both Pertwee's performance as the Doctor and also Inferno's ability to hold its audience for the most part, despite airing in the summer. Overall, this story attracted an average of 5.6 million viewers, a huge drop of 1.7 million from the previous story and the lowest story average since the War Games the previous year. It's genuinely such a shame that one of the greatest stories in all of Doctor Who's history did so poorly ratings-wise on its original broadcast. But alas, British summertime still was a powerful enemy to the show as the 1970s begun. Inferno, if anything, is absolute proof that the Doctor can be grounded on Earth and still have some imaginative and creative adventures within that limitation. It's the show's first real go at showcasing a truly parallel world, a concept of a world almost identical to ours, different in many ways. Seeing Caroline John and Nicholas Courtney playing darker versions of their familiar characters is fascinating, and both of them do an excellent job in developing these alternate selves in a matter of episodes. Also, I won't spoil it for those who haven't watched it, but Inferno has one of the most intense cliffhangers in all of Who history. So for that and the parallel world concepts alone, you should definitely check out the story for yourselves. You can read the Target novel from 1984, or listen to an audio adaptation of it from 2011. In terms of visual media, you have the VHS release from 1994, the original DVD release from 2006, but by far the best way to watch Inferno currently is from the special edition DVD release from 2013. It boasts the most special features and presents the story in the best quality to date. There's a reason why Inferno is highly regarded in Doctor Who history, being voted as the greatest Pertwee story several times. A brilliant conclusion to a brave and bold season that wasn't afraid to experiment, become a little bit more mature, and to firmly focus on how the new Doctor would fit into his 20th century Earth surroundings.
Drop him! Are you coming with me quietly? Or do I shoot you here and now? So that's season 7, the four stories that comprise it, and the ratings that they garnered. With the transmission of episode 7 of Inferno on the 20th of June 1970, season 7 of Doctor Who was brought to an end. The season ran for over 6 months, and was made up of 25 episodes across 4 stories. In terms of episode count, it showed the first major shift in terms of how many episodes viewers would get per season. After 6 years of around 40 episodes or more, the drop to nearly half of that must have been somewhat of a shock for audiences in 1970. Makes you wonder if they'd make just as much fuss as fans make now when the show gets cut by even one or two episodes. No episodes of this season are lost thankfully, but many of them only survive as black and white videotapes, with extensive colour recovery and restoration having to be performed to get them back to as close as they looked on transmission. Spearhead from Space exists on 16mm film, allowing for a clean HD transfer for Blu-ray releases. Doctor Who and the Silurians had all seven of its episodes undergo colour restoration, and Inferno had its seven episodes available in colour thanks to recordings from Canada that were then converted to the PAL format. The Ambassadors of Death has the most complex restoration. Episode 1 existed on colour videotape, but episodes 2, 3, 4, 6 and 7 all underwent chroma dot recovery, whilst episode 5 underwent colour restoration. It's thanks to the work of dedicated professionals that we can enjoy Doctor Who's first season in colour, the way it was originally intended to be viewed over 50 years ago. Let's have a look at the story averages for this season. We can see that the highest story average was with the opener, Spearhead from Space, with 8.2 million viewers. The lowest point came with the season finale, Inferno, which averaged 5.6 million, a colossal 2.6 million decrease. It was clear that audiences were both engaged with John Pertwee's Third Doctor and generally were warming to the new Earthbound format. Despite the longer stories, the introduction of new monsters such as the Autons and Silurians, the dynamic pacing of the Ambassadors of Death, and the intense stakes of Inferno all contributed to giving this season a very unique quality. If we work out the average amount of viewers across the entire season, we can calculate that the average for Season 7 of Doctor Who is around roughly 7.2 million viewers, a 0.6 increase from Season 6's average and attaining the same result as Season 5. Naturally, Season 7 had only 4 stories to average instead of 7, but considering the length of 3 quarters of those stories is abnormally long, the fact that the season's average is this high is a testament to the adventure's abilities to captivate the audience and keep them engaged. For me personally, this is honestly my favourite season of Classic Who. Despite the restricted Earthbound setting, each story feels so different and unique. Whether it's the building menace of the Autons, the calculating intelligence of the Silurians, the ominence of the Ambassadors, or the never-ending tension and drama of Inferno, Season 7 achieves what many at the time would have thought impossible. To completely change the format of Doctor Who, present a new lead actor, and transform the show for the 1970s. In all three of these aspects, I would argue Season 7 is an astounding success. It may be the most adult season of Doctor Who, but it takes itself absolutely seriously in that regard, and as a result, so do we. Frequently being cited as many fans' favourite season of the show. Season 8 in many ways would continue to develop the Earthbound setting and expand the unit family, whilst at the same time begin to get the Doctor dipping his toes back into the world of time and space. It's the beginning of 1971, and Doctor Who had just come out of what was truly a make or break year for the programme. 1970 Season 7 introduced a new Doctor, a new format for the programme, and featured stories with an arguably more mature and adult tone than anything that had come before. Such radical changes to an established programme could have easily spelled disaster, but thanks to the instant success of John Pertwee, the likability of the supporting characters, and the close to home nature of these new Earthbound stories, it all helped secure Doctor Who's place in the new decade. So now with some room to breathe, the production team were ready to make the upcoming 1971 season, season 8, bigger and better than before. There would be returning monsters, new monsters, and a brief trip off Earth, and an introduction to the Doctor's most iconic adversary. But despite all of this promise, did the viewers tune in in their millions to embrace it all? Let's delve in and find out. The first story of Season 8 is Terror of the Autons. The Time Lord Renegade known as the Master arrives on Earth to pave the way for an invasion by the Nestines. The Doctor, aided by Unit and his new assistant, Joe Grant, engages in a battle of wits with his arch nemesis to save the world. This story is comprised of four episodes, which began airing on the 2nd of January 1971 and concluded on the 23rd of the same month. Here are the individual viewing figures for all four episodes, and just like the previous season opener, things are off to a strong start. 
The ratings are almost identical to Spearhead from Space, aside from Episode 1 missing out on 8 million viewers, clocking in with 7.3 million. So looking at these numbers, what helped or hindered Doctor Who returning for its 8th year? Promotion for the new story was strong, getting a very lavish and colourful front cover on the Radio Times just as Spearhead had received the previous year. Huge emphasis was made on the new renegade Time Lord, the Master, played wonderfully by Roger Delgado. Secondly, competition on the other side at ITV was relatively weak. The most high-profile opposition was in the form of science fiction series from Irwin Allen, namely Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea and Lost in Space. Both of these in the past had impacted negatively on Doctor Who's audience, but it's arguable they both had lost their bite by 1971. Doctor Who was pumping out new, exciting, contemporary stories, whereas the Allen shows had both wrapped up with new material in 1968. So anything shown at this point were repeats, and even by the early 70s, they were already a bit dated and clunky. But one of the biggest factors, I think, that helped Doctor Who come back with a strong return was actually the longer time away from screens than normal. Just like the gap between season 6 and 7, after the conclusion of Inferno in June of 1970, Doctor Who went off the air for 6 months. Having been used to a mere 2 month gap in the show's early years, the viewers appetite for the show was arguably now even stronger than ever before. The return of the sinister Autons, who had frightened many a child as they resembled common shop window dummies, couldn't have been a bad factor either. Funnily enough, this story, just as many as season 7 had done, attracted complaints from concerned parents about the level of violence and horror in the show. Scenes featuring a killer plastic sofa and the wicked troll doll were some of the most ruthless depictions of violence that the show had ever attempted at this point. The inclusion of the Autons masquerading as policemen didn't go down well with authority figures either. While seeming tame by today's standards, it's important to remember it was a very different situation in 1971, and the question of violence and horror in Doctor Who would only continue to be a talking point as the series progressed through the 1970s. Overall, the story attracted an average of 8 million viewers, a massive 2.4 million increase from the previous story, Inferno, and when compared to Season 7's opener, it only falls short by 0.2 million. Keep in mind too that for a near 8-year-old show to still be pulling in 8 million viewers was certainly very respectable and commended by the BBC back in 1971. Terror of the Autons is a cracking way to kick off Season 8. The return of the Autons themselves is action-packed, and the unit team are on fire here, you get introduced to not only the innocence and heart of Joe Grant, played by the wonderful Katie Manning, but also the calm, sinister nature of Delgado's master, a character who would be instantly iconic and also would return in not just one, but all of Season 8's remaining stories. To enjoy this classic adventure in the written form today, you have the Target book from 1975 or its audiobook reading from 2010. For the visual mediums, you have the 1993 VHS release or the DVD release that was part of the Mannequin Mania box set from 2011. And at the time of this recording, the Season 8 Blu-ray set is due to be released in the very near future. It's an action-packed tale in four parts, and it's one that's certainly hard to forget. Who the heck are you? Well, I am usually referred to as the Master. Oh, is that so? Universally. Mm. The second story of Season 8 is The Mind of Evil. As delegates assemble for a peace conference in London, the Doctor and Joe investigate mysterious deaths at Stangmore Prison. The Master is using an alien mind parasite in a plot to steal a deadly missile, with which he intends to trigger a world war. This story is comprised of six episodes, which began airing on the 30th of January 1971 and concluded on the 6th of March. Here are the individual viewing figures for all six episodes, and whilst at first things seem a bit more sporadic, we can see that for the most part, figures are mostly consistent. The odd one out seems to be with episode one, attaining the lowest rating of the story, coming in with 6.7 million viewers, only to be immediately followed by the peak of the story, with episode 2 attaining 8.8 .8 million viewers. So, is there any explanation as to why things are jumping about in those first few weeks? Well, it hardly seems to be from the promotional side of things, because when Terror of the Autons concluded, a special trailer showcasing the Mind of Evil was immediately aired, so it's not like viewers weren't aware of the upcoming adventure. In terms of competition, it could have had an impact, Back in the day, ITV varied its programming depending on the region, so on many occasions Doctor Who would be going up against several different programs even though there was only one competing TV channel. In this case, several regions began airing a New Yorkshire sitcom, The More We Are Together. Sitcoms were just as popular in the 70s as they are today, so the arrival of a new one could have easily taken a portion of Doctor Who's audience away from Episode 1 of The Mind of Evil. 
However, given how the figures increase and stabilize for the remainder of the story, it seems like the new sitcom didn't exactly catch on the way the producers hoped it would. The main potential threat actually came on the night episode 4 was due to be broadcast, as many ITV regions were gearing up to relaunch the Jerry Anderson series, UFO. Originally attempting to launch in 1970, the first full live action drama for Anderson sadly hadn't become an instant hit like his previous puppet based shows, such as Thunderbirds and Captain Scarlet. With a push to relaunch UFO against Doctor Who, it could have ended badly for the Time Lord. However, it seems like that hope of a successful relaunch didn't quite come to pass. The Mind of Evil itself continues the trend of an Earthbound story, featuring the unit regulars and Delgado returning as the Master. I would argue it's not the strongest of the season, but it certainly has many a memorable moment to enjoy today. The more adult tone was questioned once again, but by now the series was hitting its stride in the new format, and the production team showed no immediate signs of slowing that down. Overall, this story attracted an average of 7.6 million viewers, a small 0.4 drop from the previous story. Like we've said in past installments, a 7.6 million average over a six week period is very impressive, even by today's standards, and despite the initial lower start, audiences were still coming back in their droves to see the Doctor, Joe and Unit fight against the Master. The Mind of Evil arguably is the most mature story of Season 8, and wouldn't feel out of place had it gone out the year before as part of Season 7. Nevertheless, there is still so much to love here, no less the performances by Pertwee, Manning and Delgado, a trifecta that would continue to see development through the season and indeed the next few years. To enjoy the story via the written form today, you have the Target book from 1985 and its audiobook reading from 2017. The TV soundtrack is also available as a CD release from 2009. To watch The Mind of Evil today, there is a VHS release from 1998, although it should be noted the vast majority of the story is presented here in black and white, with small snippets of colour footage from episode 6. The DVD release in 2013, however, is presented in full colour, mainly due to the restoration techniques being far more advanced and resulting in the serial being available to view in its full colour form for the first time in decades. The Mind of Evil will also appear with other Season 8 stories on the Blu-ray set that's due out this year. The Master was defeated for a second time, but it would be far from the last. But make sure you don't get too close to any Keller machines. The third story of Season 8 is The Claws of Axos. When the golden-skinned Axons arrive on Earth, offering to share the miracle of Axonite, only the Doctor is suspicious. His fears soon prove correct when it transpires that the Axons are in league with the Master, and intend to devour the Earth's energy. This story is comprised of four episodes, which began airing on the 13th of March 1971 and concluded on the 3rd of April. Here are the individual viewing figures for all four episodes, and things are a little scattered again, but overall remain consistent. The glaring figure is with episode 3, that brought in 6.4 million viewers, a new low for the series thus far. However, with a peak of 8 million for episode 2, and a strong 7 million number for the opening and closing episode, the Claws of Axos more than held its own in its 5.15pm time slot. From the information we have available, the constantly shifting figures for the story could be similar to what went on with The Mind of Evil, that being ITV's constantly changing programs that went against Doctor Who. It's not unreasonable to assume that in the week of Episode 3's broadcast, maybe across regions ITV may have just had the upper hand in grabbing people's attention. It's easy to forget that when looking at the listings of TV programs, it really could be a different program every week, depending on where you lived when it came to ITV. Having said that, both the BBC and the majority of the audience seemed very happy with this serial. During its broadcast, the controller of BBC One at the time, Paul Fox, commented on how he believed the adventure was going well. For the audience, the very visually memorable axons were able to capture the imagination of viewers the nation over, both in their elegant golden humanoid form and in their more horrific monster form. Delgado returns once again as the master, and there are some really wonderful moments towards the end of the story that he has both with the Doctor and in confronting the regular unit members. It's a fast-paced story, as many Pertwee four-parters are, and for me personally, it stands out as the main highlight of Season 8. Overall, this story attracted an average of 7.4 million viewers, a 0.2 drop from The Mind of Evil. So even though the stories overall were declining in viewership, it was by no means large or sharp enough to prompt widespread fears amongst fans or the BBC. If anything, this story feels like it could have easily been placed in the Patrick Troughton era, with very memorable monsters and several strong character moments for regulars and supporting cast alike. To enjoy The Claws of Axos in a written form, you have the Target book from 1977 and its audiobook version from 2016. 
To watch it nowadays, you can either grab the VHS from 1992 or one of two DVD releases, the first coming out in 2005 and a special edition re-release appearing in 2012. And in 2021, it will be remastered for Blu-ray as part of the Season 8 collection set. The Claws of Axos is a classic example of a Doctor Who monster romp. The inclusion of the Master actually heightens the story, and it stakes even further, and by this point it felt like Doctor Who had found where it wanted to be with itself for this era and format. And boy was it gonna run with it. But not without a little trip off world first. If I could leave, I would. If only to get away from people like you. Doctor! Answer petty obsessions! England for the English, good heavens man! I have a duty to my country, not to the world! The fourth and penultimate story of season eight is Colony in Space. On a barren alien world in the far future, the Doctor and Joe are caught in the middle of a conflict between colonists and a ruthless mining corporation. Masquerading as an adjudicator, the Master is searching for the doomsday weapon of an ancient civilization. This story is comprised of six episodes, which began airing on the 10th of April 1971 and concluded on the 15th of May. Here are the individual viewing figures for all six episodes, and damn, this is more like it! Every episode, bar the opener, pulled in over 8 million viewers, and the peak is achieved with episode 3, which had 9.5 million, and that would go on to be the most viewed episode of the entire season. This story's viewing figures would also take Doctor Who back into the top 40 in terms of the TV charts for the first time in years. Apart from episode 1, which just missed out at 41st place, the remaining 5 episodes all achieved this feat, with episodes 5 and 6 taking the highest position, both at 23rd. So what factors help contribute to the series' highest ratings in years? There are two major contributors here. The first was a shift in time slot. The first three stories of Season 8 went out at 5.15pm, a slot that Doctor Who had been no stranger to for the last eight years. However, due to the concern of the more adult and violent content raised by parents and BBC board members alike, the decision was made to move Doctor Who to just after the early evening news bulletins, placing it at a 6.10pm time slot. The massive jump in ratings from episode 2 onwards show that this move helped the show immensely, with even more adults likely to tune in after absorbing the day's news. The time slot shift also helped Doctor Who against its competition, now running against the end of the ITV news and various other programmes that in no way pack the same punch as those the other side were showing in their 5.15pm slot. The second major factor was to do with Colony in Space's story. As the title suggests, this adventure largely takes place on a different planet rather than being on Earth. It would be the first time since the War Games that the Doctor would be able to travel in his TARDIS, at the Time Lord's control of course, to keep him with the continuity. This shift was massively promoted in the Radio Times, not by a front cover, but this time via a lavish colour comic strip depicting the opening moments of Episode 1. They were designed and drawn by Frank Bellamy, an artist who would go on to be a legend in the Doctor Who art sphere. The focus on the Doctor leaving Earth for the first time in years was bound to get audiences, particularly younger ones who had complained about the lack of alien worlds, really excited for this adventure. Colony in Space would also see the Master pop up once again, and whilst Delgado's presence is always welcomed, I wouldn't have blamed anyone at the time for finding this idea starting to feel a bit stale, especially for the third Doctor's first trip off world. Also, it seems like the production team for a brief moment forgot exactly how the TARDIS materialises. There were some moments slated as being too violent, but on the whole, the majority of audiences found it suitable for family viewing, just as the show arguably had been for the entirety of its broadcast life. Overall, this story attracted an average of 8.5 million viewers, a nice 1.1 million increase from the previous story. Thanks to the later time slot and the extensive promotion, Colony in Space scores the highest story average of the Pertwee era so far, eclipsing Spearhead from Space's average of 8.2 million. What left is there to say about this tale then? In the collective fandom, Colony in Space is a story that doesn't receive the most amount of praise. As someone who loves all of the Pertwee era, I would say for me it's probably the weakest of the season and of the Third Doctor's era as the entirety. But that doesn't mean it's bad. Sure it could have been a bit shorter, but Pertwee, Manning and Delgado continue to shine on as the stars of the series. To experience Colony in the written medium, you can pick up the Target book from 1974 or its audiobook version from 2007. To watch the story, you have the VHS release from 2001 as part of the Master Tin set, or you have the DVD, which was released in 2011. Colony, along with other stories from this season, will be released on a collective Blu-ray set in 2021. The story may not be everyone's favourite, but its importance cannot be understated. It took the Doctor on his first TARDIS trip in some time, and in terms of ratings provided a key positive shift for the remainder of this season's run.
Before I was stranded on Earth, I spent all my time exploring new worlds and seeking the wonders of the universe. But you don't know what's out there. Then let's find out. The fifth and final story from Season 8 is The Demons. Dark forces gather in the village of Devil's End, where an archaeological dig releases Azal, an ancient demon. Masquerading as the local vicar, the master intends to take possession of Azal's psionic powers to rule the world, and only the Doctor stands in his way. This story is comprised of five episodes, which began airing on the 22nd of May 1971 and concluded on the 19th of June. Here are the individual viewing figures for all five episodes, and things are only seeming to get better. Not only does every episode soar past 8 million, but episode 1 manages to go one step further, attaining 9.2 million viewers. Compared to the last season finale, Inferno, where many of its episodes were stuck in the 5 million range, this is a leaps and bounds improvement. All five episodes made it into the top 40 of the TV charts too. A new peak position here comes with episode 5, which settled at 17th place. So whereas Inferno last season saw ratings take a tumble, what helped the demons avoid the same fate? We can deduce that the new time slot for Doctor Who was definitely continuing to help. Having seen ratings initially increase with Colony in Space, they only continued to grow and hold steady as the demons aired. Funnily enough, the move into British summertime seems to have had the least impact on Doctor Who thus far. In previous years, ratings around this time have always declined, and this is the first major time they have not only held, but increased. Competition on ITV had minimal impact, with shows such as Whitaker's World of Music, The Golden Shot, Nearest and Dearest, and The Sky's the Limit, all failing to take a sizable enough share away from Doctor Who. The Demons itself is often regarded not just as a fan favourite, but a favourite for those who worked on it too. John Pertwee himself frequently cited The Demons as being his favourite Doctor Who story, a feeling that is echoed by members of the Unit family, as well as producer Barry Letts, who personally requested at the time that the story be retained in the BBC archives. This sentiment was so strong that in 1993, a special VHS tape was released entitled Return to Devil's End, a special look back where John Pertwee, Nicholas Courtney, John Levine and Richard Franklin all went back to the filming locations to reminisce about the programme. Many today see it as a wonderful culmination of everything Season 8 had achieved. A great role for the Master, lots of unit action, the Third Doctor continuing to show how action-based he could be, and a fast-paced romp to say the least, with many a quotable line. Jenkins? Yeah. Shut for the wings there. Five rounds rapid. Overall, this story attracted an average of 8.3 million viewers, a small 0.2 decrease from the previous story. But these numbers, similar to the ones from Colony in Space, were giving Doctor Who its biggest audiences in years. The last time the series got an average of 8.3 million viewers or more before Pertwee's era was the Moonbase, all the way back in 1967. We have some repeat data for you as well. Due to the show's renewed popularity, particularly with this story, it was decided that the ninth season of the show would technically begin with an omnibus repeat around Christmas time. As the most recent story and a popular one at that, The Demons was chosen for this repeat slot. Airing on the 28th of December 1971, this omnibus repeat gained a viewership of 10.5 million viewers, the highest audience for any Doctor Who story since 1965. It also placed within the top 40 programmes, coming in at 38th place. A week's slate of competition from ITV, who were just putting out filler programmes for the afternoon, certainly helped. We have one more repeat figure for the Demons, this time coming from BBC Two in the year 1992. The story recently had just been recolorized, using the most modern techniques of the time, and was to be shown off on television in colour for the first time since the repeat in 1971. Here are the viewing figures for that repeat, and whilst they may seem low, we always have to remember that A, ratings for BBC Two programmes are usually lower than those on BBC One, and two, Doctor Who wasn't airing new episodes at the time, and a lot of the general public interest having waned in the late 80s. Still, this repeat attained an average of 2.5 million viewers, a far cry from the 10.5 million it had achieved 21 years prior, but still, it showed there was an interest in the programme, albeit a smaller one than in the 1970s. By the conclusion of The Demons, Doctor Who was a popular household name once again. It had successfully passed through its rocky transition period, proved millions of viewers that would tune in to see the earthbound escapades of the suave James Bond-like Doctor and his team of associates. Viewers had instantly loved to hate the Master, a villain whose legacy and impact on the show is still strongly felt to this day. The Demons is a prime example of how Delgado shined in the role and proved an immense rival to John Pertwee's third Doctor. Whilst I don't have the same level of love for this story as a lot of people do, The Demons remains an absolute must-watch. 
Or, if you wish to read it, you have the Target book from 1974 or the audiobook version released in 2008. To watch it, you have a 1993 VHS release and a DVD version arriving in 2012. The Demons will also be available on Blu-ray, as the Season 8 collection set will release in 2021. It's very difficult not to enjoy the Demons in some respect, and as the Doctor and co dance around the Maypole with joy, it's an uplifting and celebratory way to end, the show's most successful season ratings-wise in years. Now, all of you, look at the, um... Weathercock on the church tower? Weathercock! Now! So that's season eight, the five stories that comprise it, and the ratings that they garnered. With the transmission of episode five of The Demons, season eight was brought to an end, concluding another six-month run, comprised of 25 episodes across five stories. Despite many of the adventures this season having to undergo extensive colour restoration, all episodes of Season 8 exist in the BBC archives. Now, let's have a look at the story averages for this season. We can see that the highest story average comes from Colony in Space, which pulled in roughly 8.5 million viewers. Funny how the story that is arguably the most forgettable of the season had the most people watching on average at the time. The story with the lowest ratings is The Claws of Axos, which had roughly 7.4 million tuning in on average, but that number isn't really a bad number, despite it being the lowest of the season. To have all five of your show's instalments for the year pulling in audiences of 7 and 8 million is very commendable, and even members of the BBC board were impressed, with their members agreeing en masse that this series had been most successful, with an incredibly high standard. And I think there would be few who would disagree with them. From looking at the individual story averages for this season, we can calculate that the average ratings for Season 8 of Doctor Who stand at around roughly 8 million viewers, which is a 0.8 million increase from Season 7's overall average, and is the highest season average since Season 2. And it's clear that the ratings boost seen with both Colony in Space and The Demons helped push this run of stories to heights that the show hadn't seen in years. Doctor Who had completely reinvented itself, and despite a strong but shaky start with Season 7 ratings-wise, Season 8 continued the trend of a strong start, but not only held firm, but exceeded expectations. It proved this predominantly Earthbound dynamic could indeed work. It proved the strength of the leading cast, the chemistry between Unit being both likeable and infectious to watch. It proved that just because the months grow warmer in the summer season, it doesn't mean audiences are guaranteed to drop, as Doctor Who not only captured the attention of millions, but also millions more as the season progressed. With returning monsters, new aliens to fight, a rival to match the Doctor, and some truly brilliant stories, it all helped Season 8 become a roaring success, and to secure the show's future for the next foreseeable few years. For the next season, the team aimed to go even bigger and better, but would they pull it off? It's New Year's Day, 1972, and Doctor Who was set to make another triumphant return to TV screens up and down the country as its ninth season began transmitting. The first two seasons of the 1970s were successful in establishing the new Earthbound format, the regular members of the Unit family, an arch nemesis for the Doctor, that being the devilish master, and creating brand new aliens and monsters to terrorise viewers. With Season 7 establishing a strong foundation, and Season 8 only building upon it further, Doctor Who was in a healthy state to go into a new season. On the 28th of December, 1971, the Season 8 finale, The Demons, was repeated in an omnibus format, attracting a massive 10.5 million viewers, the highest average for the show since 1965. With Season 9 due to begin a mere four days later, could its opener, and indeed the subsequent stories that followed it, keep the ratings at these new heights? Or would they go the other way and spiral out of control? Let's dive right in and find out. The first story of Season 9 is Day of the Daleks. The Daleks have conquered the Earth. The only hope for humanity is a small band of gorillas who have travelled back in time to avert this terrible future. But should the Doctor let them? This story is comprised of four episodes, which began airing on the 1st of January 1972 and concluded on the 22nd of the same month. Here are the individual viewing figures for all four episodes, and these are the numbers you want to see with the start of a new season. Every episode pulled in at least 9 million viewers, with episode 2 going one step further, peaking at 10.4 million, the first time an individual episode gained over 10 million viewers since September 1965. All four episodes also placed within the top 40 programmes for their respective weeks, with episode 2 taking the highest position at 29th. So what were the key factors for Day of the Daleks being such a success in terms of viewing figures? 
Well, the first major factor we have to discuss is the Daleks themselves. They hadn't appeared on TV screens for nearly five years, last being seen in Season 4's The Evil of the Daleks, which went out initially in 1967 before being repeated in the summer of 1968. But despite having a long span of time off screen, the Daleks remained popular. Not to the dizzying heights of Dalek mania, but enough that they were still seen and cited as the Doctor's most iconic adversaries. With their return bound to draw up excitement, Doctor Who once again graced the front cover of the Radio Times, with the eye-grabbing headlines, The Daleks Are Back. This was the third time in a row that the show had received the front cover treatment for its season opener, and it seems the positive benefits that befell seasons 7 and 8 also played in favour for season 9, particularly with Day of the Daleks. As well as the Radio Times coverage, a special trailer to highlight the new season was aired days before the first episode broadcast. It featured Daleks around popular London landmarks, reminiscent of their second appearance in the Dalek Invasion of Earth. We've established in previous instalments that special trailers were something of a rarity in the early days of Doctor Who, so to receive one and the lavish Radio Times coverage was almost guaranteed to bolster up the ratings. The other major factor we always take into account in this series is competition. As 1972 began, the BBC still only had ITV to face down in the television schedules. Going out at 5.50pm, Doctor Who began its ninth season facing off against such shows as UFO, It Takes a Feath, Randall and Hopkirk Deceased, and Who Do You Do, to name a few. None of which took any significant slice of the viewing figures away from the Time Lord. Day of the Daleks may have been a grand spectacle at the time, mainly due to the Pepper Pot's return, but I would argue out of the many Dalek stories on TV, this is one where time hasn't been kind. Despite an engaging story rooted in time travel, and some wonderful performances from both the main and supporting cast, the lead sticking point this story often faces is the Daleks themselves. They're presented in colour for the first time, introducing the now iconic gunmetal grey scheme, with their leader being emblazed in gold livery. However, it's hard to believe an army of Daleks being threatening when only three props are available. Also, the voices leave a lot to be desired. Whoever is operating the time machine is an enemy of the Daleks. Overall, the story attracted an average of 9.6 million viewers. This is an astounding average to kick off Season 9, and is actually the highest average for any story since Galaxy 4 achieved 9.9 .9 million back in late 1965. From these numbers, it's clear that the appeal of the Daleks certainly hadn't faded as the 60s ended and the 70s began. We also have some repeat data for this adventure. In the summer of 1973, it was decided that Day of the Daleks would be transmitted in a cut-down omnibus format, lasting just one hour. This repeat aired on Monday the 3rd of September 1973, and managed to bring in a viewership of 9.8 million, placing it 32nd in the top 40 programmes of the week. This figure is remarkable for a few reasons. For one, despite airing in the late summer, a time when viewing figures are normally down across the board, to achieve nearly 10 million viewers for a repeat was certainly not an achievement to be overlooked. The second reason is that the competition this repeat went up against was quite formidable, first going against popular talent show Opportunity Knox, before leading into ITV's most popular soap opera, Coronation Street. These were two of ITV's biggest hitters, and the fact that they didn't really do some damage to the repeat viewing figures is surprising to say the least, and testament to the show's popularity at that time. Even though they hadn't faced the Doctor for half a decade, a combination of strong promotion, less than stellar competition, and the sheer reputation of the Daleks alone was enough to bring Doctor Who back to heights it hadn't reached in years. If you wish to enjoy the story today, you have multiple ways in which to do so. You can read the Target book from 1973, or listen to its audiobook edition from 2012. In terms of watching it, you have two separate VHS releases, the first being an omnibus edition from 1986, or the episodic version from 1995. Day of the Daleks was also the last title to be released on Betamax, being only one of few Who stories to be released on the format. Speaking of obscure formats, Day of the Daleks was also made available on the high-end Laserdisc medium, the episodic version being released on the format in 1997. But the most recent and arguably best way to enjoy the story today is via the DVD release from 2011. Not only has the picture and sound quality been restored, but it also contains a brand new version of the entire adventure. Dubbed as the special edition, this version featured new effects and perhaps more vitally, new Dalek voices, provided by new series voice actor Nicholas Briggs. Whoever is operating the time machine is an enemy of the Daleks! 
Even though I would argue some of the new effects look a bit too modern, the special edition is absolutely the definitive way to enjoy Day of the Daleks. But even on this story's original broadcast, the Daleks, despite their lack of number and unique voices, were popular enough that audiences old and new were discovering what was so great about them in the first place. Day of the Daleks began a new era for the mutated monstrosities, and it wouldn't be long before audiences would be able to see them once again. You must be exterminated! Who knows? I may have helped to exterminate you. The second story of Season 9 is The Curse of Peladon. Under the control of the Time Lords, the TARDIS takes the Doctor and Joe to Peladon, where a delegation of aliens is considering admitting the planet to the Galactic Federation. However, someone is determined to prevent this at any cost. This story is comprised of four episodes, which began airing on the 29th of January 1972 and concluded on the 19th of February. Here are the individual viewing figures for all four episodes, and we have a very mixed bag here to say the least. The first half of the story performed exceedingly well, with episode 2 in particular bringing in 11 million viewers, a new high for the Pertwee era in terms of individual episodes. Sadly, the second half of the story doesn't continue these high numbers, falling to 7.8 million for episode 3, before rising slightly to 8.4 million for the closing episode. Despite this drop, all installments by episode 3 managed to chart in the top 40 programs, episode 2 being the peak, finishing at 20th place. So what happened to the latter part of this adventure? What caused this story's viewing figures to fall so sharply? The major factor in this decrease surprisingly doesn't come from lack of promotion or indeed competition, but due to widespread industrial action. In February of 1972, there was a UK-wide miners' strike. As the miners protested for better care and wages, it resulted in many power outages for an increased period of time. Because of this, when episodes 3 and 4 went out for transmission, Many viewers were forced to miss these installments due to lack of power. For episode 4, some areas of the UK preluded the transmission with a series of colour caption cards, and a continuity announcer recapping the events of the previous episode as an aid for those who missed part 3. Nowadays, if such a thing happened, we could catch up with these episodes via services like the iPlayer, or wait for the home media release. But back in 1972, for many viewers, missing these episodes on broadcast meant missing them entirely. As repeats for the programmes were rare at the time, and the home media market was practically non-existent in the early 70s. In terms of competition from ITV, initially it was very much the same programmes that had gone out against Day of the Daleks. However, towards the end of The Curse of Peladon's run, it started facing new threats in the form of shows like Sale of the Century and the extremely popular Comedians. And due to the regionalised structure of ITV and the different areas that experienced blackouts, this new competition did impact on Doctor Who slightly, but not enough to drag its viewing figures down to a disastrous level. The story also received a decent bout of promotion, including a trailer that debuted the day before episode 1 was broadcast. The Curse of Peladon served as a return for the Ice Warriors, their first appearance in almost three years. However, in this tale they serve more as allies rather than their usual villainous place in the Doctor Who universe. Myself and many others love this angle, as it shows more of the Martians' customs and intelligence rather than them just being another set of monsters who use violence to get their way. Overall, this story attracted an average of 9.4 million viewers, a small 0.2 drop from the previous story. It's nice to see that despite a drastic decrease in the later half of the adventure, that it was still able to attain one of the best ratings averages of the entire Pertwee era. To average out at over 9 million viewers during a strike that incurred blackouts is certainly testament to the loyalty of the audience and of the mass appeal Doctor Who had at this point in time. We also have some repeat data for this story. In the summer of 1982, BBC One began airing its six-week season titled as Doctor Who and the Monsters, following the success of the repeat season known as the Five Faces of Doctor Who, which had gone out in November of 1981. One of the stories to be featured in this new block of repeats was The Curse of Peladon, being compiled into two bumper-length episodes instead of the original four. Airing on the 12th and 19th of July 1982, here are the viewing figures for this repeat. Whilst neither cracked the top 40 programs chart, an average of 4.7 million for a repeat is still very respectable, and not catastrophic. Certainly better than the figures attained by Doctor Who repeats that would go on to air in the 1990s. In terms of enjoying The Curse of Peladon today, you can either read the adventure via the Target book from 1975, or one of the many audio releases on CD or even cassette. You can watch the story via the 1993 VHS release, 
or the 2010 DVD that was released as part of the Peladon Tales box set. The Curse of Peladon was another successful story for Season 9 to notch onto its belt. The Ice Warrior's more heroic return was received well with audiences, and the world of Peladon is a layered and detailed one for us to explore as an audience, so much so that it wouldn't be long before both the planet and the Ice Warriors themselves would be seen on our TV screens again. Which way now? Which way indeed? Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Meeny? The third story from Season 9 is The Sea Devils. The Doctor and Joe pay a visit to the Master, who is imprisoned on an island off the coast of England. The Doctor discovers that numerous shipwrecks have been caused by aquatic creatures who are colluding with the Master to take over the world. This story is comprised of six episodes, which began airing on the 26th of February 1972 and concluded on the 1st of April. Here are the individual viewing figures for all six episodes, and despite power being mostly restored by March, sadly the ratings do not recover to the heights of the previous two stories. The peak here is with episode 2, which pulled in a strong showing of 9.7 million viewers. The low point came one week before with episode 1, which had over 3 million less people watching, finishing with a viewership of 6.4 million. Despite the lower numbers, three of the six episodes placed into the top 40 programs charts, with episode 2 charting highest, reaching 26th place. Why then did the Sea Devils not carry on the initial high figures that season 9 began with? For episode 1, the main culprit for the significantly lower figures was still, most likely, the power blackouts that were happening all across the UK, and despite the strike being over as March began, there were sadly some lasting effects on the Sea Devils ratings. Even though many episodes still reached over 8 million people, a lot of them moved over for offerings on ITV, partly due to the structure of their programming. Doctor Who in the 20th century was a serialised show, with one story being told over a number of weeks. If someone missed an episode, there was less incentive for them to tune in next week, as they wouldn't necessarily know how the overall story had progressed. So, if people missed the opening part of The Sea Devils, they were less likely to jump in at episode 2, not knowing what on earth was going on. This benefited ITV, as most programmes going up against Doctor Who at the time were either reruns, comedy shows, quiz shows, or old films, all programmes where continuity arguably wasn't as important and structurally more accessible for audiences to just tune into. The Sea Devils had received a decent amount of promotion though, getting small illustrations in the Radio Times and a special trailer that had aired the day before broadcast. However, again, millions would have missed this teaser due to the power blackouts, which is a shame, as this adventure is quintessential Earthbound Doctor Who. Great performances from the leads, a magnificent appearance from Roger Delgado as the Master, and the introduction of yet another iconic monster in the Sea Devils, who were also linked to the popular Season 7 monster, the Silurians. Like their cousins, their impact would last for many years, and they'd even get a chance to return, though it would be quite some time before they did. Overall, this story attracted an average of 8.2 million viewers, a sharp 1.2 million drop from The Curse of Peladon. Although, as discussed, we can attribute much of the cause of this drop to the power blackouts during February that afflicted the opening episode, this being one instance that the serialised format of the show worked against it in terms of ratings. Still, despite the effect of the blackouts, to gain an 8.2 million average over six weeks is still very impressive. We also have a lot of repeat data for this story. Firstly, the story was repeated as a 90 minute compilation on Wednesday, the 27th of December 1972, gaining an audience of 8.7 million, a very strong showing for a repeat. It seems like after the success of the Demons repeat that went out just before season 9, it only seemed logical another repeat airing right before season 10's debut would achieve similar results. The next repeat of the Sea Devils was actually unplanned. On Monday the 27th of May 1974, due to industrial action, the BBC was unable to show its coverage of a Yorkshire vs Lancashire cricket game. At very short notice, the compilation edit of the Sea Devils was thrown in the schedules to fill the gap, going out at 11.15am. It gained a much lower rating of 4.6 million, but we can't be too harsh with this one. It was shown early in the day, a time when most people were at work and children were at school, and furthermore, it was shown in the week between parts 4 and 5 of Planet of the Spiders, the final adventure of the John Pertwee era. Naturally, audiences were arguably more concerned with watching The Last Adventure of the Third Doctor instead of a repeat, but even then, 4.6 million in these conditions isn't exactly catastrophic. Our last lot of repeat data comes from BBC Two, which aired The Sea Devils over six weeks from the 6th of March to the 10th of April in 1992. 
we can see that all six episodes sit very comfortably in the 3 million range, with an average of 3.2 million viewers. Whilst this may be the lowest ratings for the Sea Devils thus far, as always with these 90s repeats, there are a few things we have to take into account. The 1990s saw the growth and mass acceptance of satellite channels, giving viewers the option to access hundreds if not thousands of different channels and programming. Also, in 1992, Doctor Who was predominantly off the air, so with no new episodes and much more competition, it makes a 3.2 million average a lot more impressive. If you missed all of these repeats initially, there are thankfully many ways in which you can enjoy the Sea Devils today. Whether it be via the Target book from 1974, various audio releases on CD, the VHS from 1995, or on DVD as part of the Beneath the Surface box set, which arrived in 2008. The Sea Devils is often cited as being one of the standout stories of the Pertwee years. Whether it be the iconic look of the creatures themselves, or the great dynamic between the Doctor and the Master, there are so many elements of this story that are just gorgeous, and symbolise a production team at the absolute peak of their confidence and passion for the show they were making. What are you watching? It seems to be a rather interesting extraterrestrial life form. Only puppets, you know, for children. Oh. The fourth and penultimate story from Season 9 is The Mutants. The Time Lords send the Doctor and Joe into the far future, where the planet Solos is about to be granted independence after years of Earth rule. However, the governing Marshal is unwilling to relinquish his position of power. This story is comprised of six episodes, which began airing on the 8th of April 1972 and concluded on the 13th of May. Here are the individual viewing figures for all six episodes, and despite a strong opening figure of 9.1 million, most of this story seems to hold within the 7 million range. The lowest point actually comes with the closing episode, which attained 6.5 million viewers, charting a 2.6 million drop from the beginning of this adventure to the end. The first three episodes all charted in the top 40 programs, with episode 1 placing highest at 29th. Things seem to be gradually slipping as season 9 progresses on, but is there anything specific causing it to happen? In terms of promotion, the mutants continued the trend of having small illustrations accompanying the program's listings in the Radio Times, as well as receiving a continuity announcement to tease it over the closing credits of the Sea Devils. Though it is key to note, the mutants did not receive a dedicated trailer, unlike the previous stories of Season 9, which all did. In terms of the time of year that the mutants was airing in, it occurred during the transition into British summertime, with lighter evenings and warmer weather keeping people outside and away from their television screens. Also, competition on ITV was ramped up significantly during the Mutants broadcast. All of the major regions were airing a brand new variety show, funny you should say that, which right out of the gate was attracting very high ratings, thus taking audiences away and negatively impacting Doctor Who. The Mutants, however, is a cracking story to sit down to. Its strong messages and themes are all executed brilliantly, and even though the monsters may look a bit comical today, I highly recommend you give the whole thing another viewing. There are themes in this story from 1972 that still alarmingly hold up and have weight nearly 50 years later. Overall, this story attracted an average of 7.8 million viewers, a 0.4 drop from the previous story. Again though, this is far from a poor showing. To average nearly 8 million viewers for a six-part story against the changing seasons and strong competition is a testament to the strengths in storytelling that the mutants proudly showcased. To enjoy this story today, you can either enjoy it in written form via the Target book from 1977 or its audio adaptation from 2018. It was one of the last VHS tapes to be released for the series back in 2003, receiving its DVD release eight years later in 2011. The Mutants may not be the most memorable story of Season 9, but it's one that certainly has a lot to say and a lot of commendable performances and set pieces that do a good job of making a lasting impression on the viewer something Doctor Who was good at doing from the off back in 1963. Good evening, sir. Will you please come with us to reception? I assume I have no choice. This way, sir. The fifth and final story from Season 9 is the Time Monster. The Master is conducting experiments on the Crystal of Kronos, an ancient Atlantean relic. His intention is to summon the all-powerful Kronos. The Doctor knows that the Master will be unable to control the creature, and pursues him back in time to Atlantis. This story is comprised of six episodes, which began airing on the 20th of May 1972 and concluded on the 24th of June. Here are the individual viewing figures for all six episodes, and sadly, the last minute rise that season eight had experienced the year before doesn't seem to have happened here. The peak of the story comes with episode three, which had 8.1 million tuning in. 
whereas the low point came with episode 5, which managed to pull in 6 million viewers. Despite these lower ratings overall, four of the six episodes made their way into the top 40 programs charts, episode 4 being the highest, finishing at 28th place. So why couldn't the Time Monster manage the same increase in ratings as the Demons had done last year? Well in terms of promotion, aside from the standard listings and small windows of artwork, the Time Monster didn't receive any further extensive promotion within the Radio Times, nor did it receive a unique trailer that followed the end of the previous story. Competition was also holding steady over at ITV, with regions either showing the popular quiz show, Sale of the Century, or a brand new sitcom, The Train Now Standing. Both were attracting favourable viewing figures and taking audience share away from Doctor Who. This decline in viewing figures was even noted by members of the BBC's Programme Review Board, who acknowledged that ratings for the Time Monster hadn't reached the same heights as the Demons the previous year. However, head of the drama group, Sean Sutton, pointed out that viewing figures had increased by roughly 50% during John Pertwee's run as the Doctor, compared to the last few years of the 1960s. Furthermore, airing throughout May and June, the Time Monster was going out firmly within British summertime, and whilst its effects hadn't affected the Demons the year previous, it seems that the Time Monster wasn't as lucky, as lower figures in the summer are typically common across most channels. Also, the Time Monster was airing 20 minutes earlier than the Demons, each episode going out at 5.50pm. Don't let these worries of lower numbers put you off the Time Monster though. It's an immensely fun way to close off the season. Jaunts to Atlantis, the inclusion of the Unit family, the Master being just as devilish as always, and some pretty ambitious concepts all help keep the Time Monster memorable to those who watch it. Plus the story concludes with a naked Sergeant Benton. What more could you ask for? Overall this story attracted an average of 7.4 million viewers, a 0.4 drop from the previous story. Whilst it's a far cry from the near 10 million average of Day of the Daleks, it's still a very respectable average overall for a 1972 story. For your lowest average of the season to be 7.4 million, I mean, it's not something to be ashamed of. The Time Monster may have its flaws, but its six episodes showcase a cast and crew who are confident in what they're creating and are clearly having the time of their lives in making it. To enjoy this adventure today, you have the Target book from 1986, the VHS from 2001 as part of the Master Tin set, and most recently, a DVD release from 2010 as part of the Myth and Legends box set. Whilst history in some aspects has not been kind to this story, I recommend you go back and give it another go. It's a lot of fun if you indulge in all the madness, and it serves as a fitting prelude for the more fantasy based adventures that were to come. Bonus, welcome! So that's season 9 the five stories that comprise it, and the ratings that they garnered. With the transmission of episode 6 of The Time Monster, season 9 was brought to an end, concluding another 6 month run comprised of 26 episodes across 5 stories. All 26 of those episodes exist today in the BBC archives, however 15 of them have undergone some form of conversion or restoration in order to get them looking as close as possible to their original 1972 broadcast. All 4 episodes of The Day of the Daleks exist on their original colour videotapes, the Curse of Peladon had all four of its episodes undergo the reverse standards conversion process, thus taking an NTSC tape and converting it back to the PAL format. Before this process, tapes either only existed in black and white in the PAL regions, or in some cases didn't exist at all. The first three episodes of The Sea Devils also underwent this process, as did episodes 1 and 2 of The Mutants. The Time Monster's restoration is similar to how Doctor Who and the Silurians and Terror of the Autons had their colour restored by combining signals of a high quality black and white print and a lower quality colour signal. We always have to thank those professionals who tirelessly worked at helping to restore these episodes to how they were originally made and meant to be viewed. Now let's have a look at the story averages for this season. We can see that the highest story average comes from the opener, Day of the Daleks, with 9.6 million on average tuning in. This hardly comes as a surprise, as we mentioned earlier, the long awaited return of the Daleks coupled with strong promotion and weak competition more than helped guarantee strong viewing figures for this story. The lowest story average comes with the finale, The Time Monster, which attains 7.4 million viewers. And this represents a 2.2 million drop on average across season 9, but again, to finish the season with 7.4 million viewers tuning in is no failure. Season 9, if anything, proved that Doctor Who's popularity was only growing with each subsequent set of stories. 
The return of the Daleks and the Ice Warriors, coupled with the arrival of the Sea Devils, the continuing presence of the Malevolent Master, all helped create a group of adventures that were engaging, exciting, and made it very hard to turn over to the other side. But now as we always do, let's do some calculations. By combining the average ratings for each story, we can calculate that the average viewing figures for Season 9 of Doctor Who stand at roughly around 8.5 million viewers. This is a half a million increase from Season 8's average, and the second highest season average thus far behind Season 2's 10.4 million. The John Pertwee era was continuing to become more popular, and ultimately, be viewed by a lot more people. By Season 9's conclusion, the initial decision in 1969 to make Doctor Who more Earth-based and to give him a regular team had arguably paid off entirely. Ratings were higher than they had been in years, loads of new monsters to fight, plenty of the older ones making a splash of a return for the 1970s, and a rival Time Lord to give the Doctor some of his biggest challenges to date. Even with all this success in terms of viewing figures, it's arguably not even the peak of the Pertwee era in this respect. Season 10 was now approaching, and it's arguably there that the peak of the Third Doctor's popularity would be achieved. In the last few days of 1972, Doctor Who was gearing up for the debut of its 10th season on television. But before any episodes even aired, the hype around this particular set of stories was building. It would mark the 10th run of adventures since the show began, with many publications citing it to be the show's 10th anniversary. Ironic really, as the season would start transmitting shortly after the show's 9th birthday, and not even reach the 10th. But saying that, Doctor Who always enjoyed a bit of free promotion and chatter amongst the press and the public and with John Pertwee about to go into his fourth year playing the Doctor, this season would cement him as the show's longest running lead at that time. With his previous three seasons, the production had successfully established the Earthbound setting, the building of the Unit family, the introduction of the Doctor's nemesis, the Master, and brought back classic villains such as the Daleks and the Ice Warriors to complement new menaces, including the Silurians, the Autons, and the Sea Devils. So with season 10 on the way, and public interest arguably at a new peak, just how on earth would the show fare in the ratings? And what new tricks could they pull out of the bag to keep people watching? Well, for their first trick, it certainly was quite the surprise. The first story from Season 10 is The Three Doctors. The Time Lord's energy reserves are being drained by a mysterious force within a black hole. Their only hope is to combine the forces of all three Doctors to battle an ancient figure from Time Lord history. This story is comprised of four episodes, which began airing on the 30th of December 1972 and concluded on the 20th of January 1973. Here are the individual viewing figures for all four episodes, and these numbers are exactly what you want to kick off a new season, and for a celebratory opener at that. The peak comes with episode 4, which achieves the highest viewing figures for an individual Pertwee episode yet, bringing in 11.9 million viewers. The remaining three episodes also bring in very good numbers, with even the lowest point, episode 3's 8.8 .8 million, still scoring a higher result than many stories had done over the past few years. Somewhat surprisingly, only two episodes placed within the top 40 TV programs for their respective weeks. Episode 2 came in 22nd place, whilst Episode 4 takes the show into the top 20, finishing at 17th. With the highest figures for a Pertwee season opener yet, what helped contribute to the three Doctors' success in the ratings? The most obvious answer is the fact that all three actors who had played the Doctor on TV at that point were going to be appearing together. We get excited even now when multi-Doctor stories are aired, so for the three Doctors, the first instance of this, it must have been a fan's dream come true, especially if you'd have been watching the show since the start back in 1963. The story also received, understandably, a lot of promotion. For the fourth year in a row, Doctor Who had its season opener promoted on the front cover of the Radio Times, with a great shot of all three actors adorning the page. As well as interviews inside the Radio Times, the three stars popped up in various other publications, as well as John Pertwee making appearances on other popular programmes, such as Bruce Forsyth in The Generation Game and Pebble Mill at One, the latter alongside Patrick Troughton. Another bout of promotion came in the form of a short trailer, which aired a few hours before a repeat of The Sea Devils on the 27th of December 1972. These trailers started to become more of a common occurrence during the Pertwee era, and whilst not every story was given one, it made sense that the season opener, and the one featuring three Doctors at that, should be given this special treatment. So with all that promotion behind it, how did the competition over at ITV hold up? Well, not so good. For those unaware, back in the day ITV operated on a regional structure, so a programme shown say in London won't necessarily be shown in Yorkshire, just as an example. 
During the Three Doctors broadcast, it went up against all sorts, such as classic films, quiz shows, and American imports, mostly programs Doctor Who had faced before and come out as the winner. Though to be honest, with the Three Doctors gimmick proving to immediately draw viewers' attention and interest, I think it's fair to say that the other side didn't stand much of a chance. As the story transmitted, it became clear that the first Doctor, played by William Hartnell, would have quite a smaller role compared to his two successors. Many may not have known at the time, but Hartnell was suffering extensively from arteriosclerosis. It diminished his health in a number of aspects, one being that it caused his memory to deteriorate. Whilst he does still appear as the character he originated, he reads his lines from cue cards, which, considering he was a very ill man at this point, you can only commend him for returning to the role one last time, to help celebrate a show that he had helped make a success. The Three Doctors was William Hartnell's last work for television. He would pass away a little over two years later, in April of 1975, at the age of 67. Overall, this story attracted an average of 10.3 million viewers, and boy is it nice to see a Doctor Who story average over 10 million again. It was the first time the show had achieved this milestone since The Web Planet, which had aired almost 8 years previously. For the Pertwee era, it's the strongest average thus far, making it the most viewed story overall. Compared to previous season openers, it's a 0.7 increase from Season 9's Day of the Daleks, a further continuation of the boost in figures the BBC were hoping for when they both cast Pertwee as the lead and agreed on a shift to a more Earthbound focus. We also have some repeat data for this story. The Three Doctors was selected to be part of BBC Two's Five Faces of Doctor Who season, which showed a classic story from each of the Doctors. Airing on four consecutive days between the 23rd and 26th of November, 1981, here are the viewing figures for this repeat, which gained an average of 5.3 million viewers. Whilst this may seem low, and indeed 5 million lower than the initial transmission, do take note that this repeat aired over on BBC Two, a channel which often doesn't reach the same dizzying heights of 10 million viewers the same way BBC One does. Also, all four episodes in this repeat made it into the top 20 programmes on BBC Two, showing that even as early as 1981, Doctor Who had potential and pulling power in re-airing classic adventures. The Three Doctors truly celebrated Doctor Who, both in how far it had come since 1963 and in what new opportunities awaited the Doctor, with the conclusion of the story seeing his exile by the Time Lords becoming a thing of the past, his knowledge of time travel returned to him, his ability to roam time and space restored. The story itself may not be seen as the greatest by today's standards, but for many a fan it's a story rooted in nostalgia, importance and fun. Seeing John Pertwee and Patrick Troughton bicker and banter their way through the story is nothing short of charming. It's great to see the unit regulars interact with the second Doctor again, and Omega as the villain leaves such a sizeable impact. His place in Time Lord mythology would be expanded and cemented over the next few decades, and seeing our heroes go up against him here is both intimidating and also very exciting. To enjoy this milestone adventure today, you can experience it in the written form via the Target book from 1975 or its audio adaptation from 2010. To watch it, you have the VHS release from 1991 and two different DVDs, the initial one from 2003 and a special edition re-release as part of the Revisitations 3 set from 2012. The story is also available on Blu-ray as part of the Season 10 collection box set. The Three Doctors to me holds a very special place as it was the very first story from the classic era of the show that I ever watched back in November of 2005. Despite the clunkiness of some of the monsters or set pieces, I was absolutely whisked away as a nine-year-old to this weird and wonderful world of 70s Who. I immediately took to all three Doctors, Joe Grant as the Companion, the Unit Regulars and the villainous Omega. So say what you will about it now, but The Three Doctors is a story that for me, I could never ever let go of. Now please, you're only confusing my assistant. Joe, it's all quite simple. I am he and he is me. And we are all together, Goo Goo mm -hmm. What? It's a song by the Beatles. Oh, how does it go? Oh please be quiet. The second story from season 10 is Carnival of Monsters. On the planet Inter Minor, Vorg and Scherner unveil the Miniscope, a technological peep show full of monstrous terror, and the Doctor and Joe are trapped within its horrors. This story is comprised of four episodes, which began airing on the 27th of January 1973 and concluded on the 17th of February. Here are the individual viewing figures for all four episodes, and this is a nice strong showing, isn't it? All episodes hold within the 9 million range, the peak being the opening episode which pulled in 9.5 million viewers. 
and when your lowest rating is 9 million on the dot, you know your story has done exceptionally well. Three out of the four episodes also made it into the top 40 TV programs, with episode 3 just missing out, and episode 1 taking the highest position at 29th place. So what helped Carnival of Monsters achieve some of the show's most consistently strong viewing figures? In many ways, a lot of the promotional strength that was given to the three Doctors was also given to this story. Whilst there was no front cover on the Radio Times, Carnival of Monsters did receive a special short trailer, which aired immediately after the closing episode of The Three Doctors. Also, this story had the appeal of being the first adventure where the Doctor could travel in the TARDIS without it being controlled or on some sort of mission for the Time Lords. For fans who had watched in the black and white era, this certainly would have held some incentive to tune in. Competition over at ITV was once again varied, but many of the shows weren't pulling in numbers even close to Doctor Who. Alongside the onslaught of repeats of shows such as The Man From U.N.C.L.E. and UFO, the biggest hitter came in the form of quiz show Sale of the Century. This show had dented Doctor Who's ratings towards the end of Season 9, but it seems on this occasion it didn't quite pack the same punch. Even when ITV changed up most of its regional schedules halfway through Carnival of Monsters run, it still didn't take any extra chunks of viewers away from the Time Lord. This story itself is often seen as one of the gems of the Pertwee era, and it's very easy to see why. The characters are all very likeable, some of the design work, particularly inside the miniscope, is fantastic, the drashigs for the most part are convincing and horrifying, and the whole story has a sense of pace and urgency that John Pertwee and Katie Manning carry off extraordinarily well. There is no doubt how strong their bond is by this point either, which will only go on to break our hearts later on in Season 10. But more on that when we get there. Overall, this story attracted an average of 9.2 million viewers, a 1.1 million drop from the previous story. That may be a bit of a sharp decline, but 9.2 million is not a figure to be shrugged at, especially for TV in 1973. It was almost inevitable that after the hype and buzz around the three Doctors wore off, that part of the audience wasn't going to tune in again. But if anything, the fact Carnival of Monsters kept over 9 million people captivated and interested is fantastic and downright impressive. We do also have some repeat data for this story. Just like the three Doctors, Carnival of Monsters was selected to be aired as part of the Five Faces of Doctor Who repeat season over on BBC Two. Going out rather oddly the week before the three Doctors, between the 16th and 19th of November 1981, here are the viewing figures for this repeat which gained an average of 5.3 million. The average is around the same game by the Three Doctors repeat of this same season, and like that story too, Carnival also placed in the top 20 programs for BBC Two, with all four of its episodes. Carnival of Monsters is such a joyous story to watch today. It's so nice to see John Pertwee play his version of the Doctor, unconstrained by Time Lord restrictions, and what an adventure to kick that theme off with. To enjoy it today, you have the Target book from 1977 and its audio adaptation from 2014. To watch it, you have the VHS release from 1995 and two different DVDs, the original release from 2002 and a special edition re-release as part of the Revisitations 2 set from 2011. It's also available on Blu-ray as part of the Season 10 collection box set. If you're trying to get people into the world of classic Doctor Who, this is certainly a story I would recommend as a jumping on point. It's so full of fun, many iconic characters and scenes, and a leading pair who are at the top of their game and are having the most brilliant time of their lives whilst doing it. Without a doubt, one of the quintessential Doctor Who classics. Good afternoon. The third story from Season 10 is Frontier in Space. The universe is on the verge of war between humans and draconians, and the Doctor and Joe are caught in the middle, but other forces are working for their own evil purpose, as the Doctor discovers when he faces the Master. This story is comprised of six episodes, which began airing on the 24th of February 1973 and concluded on the 31st of March. Here are the individual viewing figures for all six episodes, and sadly numbers have taken another sharp drop, with the bulk of this story holding within the 7 million range. Not necessarily a bad figure at all, but to lose over 2 million viewers from the previous story is an eyebrow raiser to say the least. The peak comes with episode 1, which has a figure more akin to Carnival as it brought in 9.1 million viewers. The lowest point comes with episode 4, which falls 2 million below the peak with 7.1 million tuning in. Only episodes 1 and 6 made it into the top 40 programs chart, with episode 1 coming in at 32nd place. 
So whilst these are far from catastrophic numbers, what happened during Frontier in Space to cause viewing figures to drop so suddenly? Well, to start with, the promotional arm wasn't flexing quite as much as it had done with the previous two stories. There was no special trailer on TV, and no cover on the Radio Times. There were nice little art pieces for each episode's listing, drawn by the legendary Frank Bellamy, but beyond that, nothing else was really done to push this story in front of the nation. Competition on ITV remained largely unchanged across most regions, with old rivals going up against Doctor Who including Tarzan, It Takes a Thief, UFO, whilst also fighting some new competition including the Beverly Hillbillies, Doctor at Large, and the Big Valley. None of these programs have been noted for taking any substantial viewership away from Doctor Who, continuing to prove that the Pertwee era of the show had a strong connection with audiences. The lack of promotion against a relatively weak slate of competition is surprising, and considering one of the main villains in Frontier in Space is the Doctor's archenemy, the Master at that. Although, as wonderful as Roger Delgado is, there were certainly early signs of a Master fatigue going on at the time. Having appeared in every story of Season 8 and then popping up twice in Season 9, there were some viewers who claimed they were getting a bit bored of the villain as Time Lord. A lot of these criticisms seem to stem from people wanting more variety in terms of villains, rather than Roger Delgado's performance. Sadly, Frontier in Space would tragically mark the final time in which Delgado would play the Master. For on the 18th of June, 1973, mere months after Frontier had aired, whilst filming in Turkey, he was killed along with a Turkish technician in a car accident. The chauffeur driving the car, to make up for lost time, drove far too fast, causing the car to spin off a road and into a ravine. Roger was 55 years old. The news of Delgado's death shocked viewers in the UK, but they hit no one else harder than the production team of Doctor Who. For the past few years, Roger had been viewed as one of the family amongst the series regulars, and it's his tragic death that is often cited as being one of the many reasons why the other regulars wanted to move on shortly afterwards. But whilst he never got a final battle with the Doctor on TV, the legacy that Roger Delgado has left with the Master is clear for all to see. He was very much the Doctor's Moriarty, and solidly laid the foundations for all the following Master incarnations to come. Overall, this story attracted an average of 8 million viewers, a 1.2 decrease from the previous story. It's a shame to see a further big decline like this, but once again, I can't stress enough how despite that, an 8 million average for a six-part adventure in 1973 is still very much a success. If you don't believe me, even members of the BBC Programme Review Board were singing this story's praises. The board commented that episode 1 was a good start to another good story. Head of Drama Series, Andrew Osborne, claimed that episode 2 was remarkably good, and Head of Drama Serials, Ronald Marsh, felt that episode 5 had excellent production values. It's no secret, however, that as time has gone on, Frontier in Space is increasingly looked upon as being an overly long, dull, and tedious adventure. The most common joke being that the Doctor and Joe escape one prison cell only to be thrown in another for a good few episodes. And whilst that may be true to an extent, and the story as a whole has a much slower tone compared to many Pertwee adventures, I would argue there is still a lot to love. The Draconian species, both as a society and in terms of their design, are an extremely interesting race. The whole dynamic of the Earth-Draconia war is also explored and expanded, showcasing the brilliant writing talents of Malcolm Hulk, who penned some of the finest and most topical scripts of the early 1970s. To enjoy Frontier in Space today, you can read the Target novel from 1976, which was retitled to The Space War, or its audio adaptation from 2008. To watch it, you have the VHS release from 1995, the DVD version from 2009 as part of the Dalek War box set, or the 2019 release on Blu-ray as part of the Season 10 collection set. Frontier in Space may not be everyone's favourite, but I'd recommend going back and giving it another chance. Pertwee and Manning continue to be on top form, and despite not getting the ending he deserved, Roger Delgado delivers one final fantastic performance as the charming but malevolently evil master. Oh, and in the last few minutes of Episode 6, the Daleks pop up. Huh, I wonder if they'll have a bigger presence in the next story. Right, we'll see who rules the galaxy when this is over. Do not fail the Daleks indeed, you stupid tin boxes. The fourth and penultimate story from Season 10 is Planet of the Daleks. At the request of the wounded Doctor, the Time Lords pilot the TARDIS to the hostile planet Spyrodon. There, the Doctor and Joe join forces with a group of Thals to prevent the Daleks from launching a galactic invasion. This story is comprised of six episodes, which began airing on the 7th of April 1973 
and concluded on the 12th of May. Here are the individual viewing figures for all six episodes, and wow, okay, talk about a surprise shoot up. The first three episodes skyrocket over the 10 million threshold, with episode one being the peak, with 11 million viewers tuning in. Even the last three episodes, which all fall under 10 million, still pull in impressive numbers. The low point of 8.3 million with episode four hardly being a sign of failure. All six episodes made the top 40 programs, with episode one getting a special note as it took Doctor Who back into the top 10 in nearly a decade, settling at ninth place. So with huge numbers like this, what proved to be so popular about Planet of the Daleks? Well, for starters, like the Three Doctors and Carnival of Monsters before it, Planet of the Daleks received a special trailer on the day of Episode 1's transmission to help promote the story. Funnily enough, the trailer didn't contain any footage from the upcoming adventure, instead using Dalek footage from the previous story, Frontier in Space, presumably to bring viewers back up to speed with what the Daleks were up to. Aside from this, what helped Episode 1 achieve its 11 million figure could actually be placed down to what else was airing on BBC One that day. The episode went out 20 minutes later than scheduled due to the boat race overrunning, and following Planet of the Daleks was the ever popular Eurovision Song Contest. With two major events either side of Doctor Who, it's understandable to assume that many extra viewers would catch the program, either because they had just enjoyed a good day's boat racing, or because they wanted to see what Eurovision had to offer later on. It's curious how that extra chunk of viewership seemingly stuck around for episodes 2 and 3, before the last half of the story sees ratings fall below 10 million. Did competition over at ITV have anything to do with this? Many regions were still airing repeats opposite Doctor Who, in this case shows like The Persuaders and The Western Bonanza. However, some regions were opting for variety specials in their bid for viewership. But it seems even with stars like Julie Andrews as the headline, Doctor Who still came out on top. Planet of the Daleks is another wonderful off-world adventure for Pertwee's third Doctor. Sporting a very snazzy purple suit, I believe we see some of his strongest scenes in this story. The Daleks also get a bit snazzy too, as a Dalek Supreme joins the ranks, emblazoned in black and gold livery. It's a shame he only appears in the final episode, but I would argue this story is leaps and bounds superior to the previous season's Day of the Daleks. Even if author Terry Nation was slightly going through the motions in terms of the story's plot, often being cited as a retread of his first script for the show, The Daleks, but hey, at least he remembered that the Daleks can paralyze people aside from just killing them, right? Wait! Wait! Somebody's still in there! Save for interrogation! Disabled. Overall, this story attracted an average of 9.7 million viewers, a 1.7 increase from the previous story. A sharp boost in the upward direction proves that Season 10 wasn't just on a decline after the opening story. This figure places it as the second most viewed story of the season so far, right behind the three Doctors. The everlasting popularity of the Daleks, appearing in the first script from their creator in nearly a decade, the beautifully realised world of Spyridon, it all culminates in being one of the Third Doctor's most memorable and beloved adventures. We also have some repeat data for this story, coming this time from BBC One. In the 1990s, a time when Doctor Who wasn't being made, one way in which fans could get their fix was from an increasingly growing number of repeats. Most of these came on channels such as BBC Two or UK Gold, but on the odd occasion, Doctor Who would appear on its original channel, BBC One. As such, in 1993, Planet of the Daleks was chosen to represent Doctor Who for its 30th anniversary, and would air on BBC One from the 5th of November to the 17th of December 1993. There was no episode aired on the 26th of November, due to children in need, and so that some new Doctor Who, the most canonical Doctor Who story ever, could be premiered. But jokes aside, here are the viewing figures for this repeat, which pulled in an average of 3.6 million viewers. Considering this aired at a time when Doctor Who's popularity was on the decline, and when going up against Coronation Street over on ITV, I would argue this kind of average for a 20 year old story at that time isn't bad at all. Planet of the Daleks may very well be a greatest hits compilation of past glories, but by god does it pull it off remarkably effectively. To enjoy this greatest hits today, you have the Target book from 1976, and its audio adaptation from 2013. To watch the story, you have the VHS from 1999 as part of a metal Dalek tin set, or you have the DVD release from 2009 as part of the Dalek War Box set. Plus you also have the Blu-ray, which forms part of the Season 10 collection set from 2019. 
Whether you love the Daleks, the dynamic between the Doctor and Joe, the reappearance of the Thals, or everything else in between, Planet of the Daleks does indeed offer something for everyone. It's a fan favourite amongst many, and it's one of the stories from the Pertwee era that I think will always be held amongst the highest regard. Another strong recommendation from me, in what is shaping to be one of the most stellar seasons of the show yet. The responsibility was yours. You have failed. The Supreme Council does not accept failure. The fifth and final story from Season 10 is The Green Death. When a miner is found dead and glowing bright green in a disused Welsh mine, Unit and the Doctor are called in to investigate. The culprit appears to be Global Chemicals and its mysterious boss, whose sinister plans extend far beyond the small Welsh mining town. This story is comprised of six episodes, which began airing on the 19th of May 1973 and concluded on the 23rd of June. Here are the viewing figures for all six episodes, and it's such a shame that such an iconic and brilliant story sees the viewing figures crash downward once again. The high point is with episode 1, which pulled in 9.2 million viewers. It was the only episode that surpassed the 9 million mark, with the lowest rating coming with episode 4, which brought in 6.8 million. However, despite these numbers being a bit all over the place, all six episodes of The Green Death placed within the top 40 TV programs, episode 5 taking the highest position, coming in at 15th place. So despite the lower numbers when compared to a lot of season 10, how come The Green Death in many ways was still so successful? It was common knowledge by this point that Katie Manning would be departing from the series at the conclusion of The Green Death. Katie had played the part of Joe Grant for three years, and despite becoming one of the longest serving and most beloved of the Doctor's companions, she felt it was time to move on to pastures new. Joe's exit was indeed a big part of the promotion for The Green Death, Katie herself appeared on various TV and radio programs to talk about her time on the show and to promote her upcoming new venture, Serendipity, a show all about alternative lifestyles and one in which she would host later that year. The competition at ITV continued to change over the six weeks The Green Death was on the air. Julie Andrews remained a firm adversary in the schedules, as did The Mike and Bernie Show, and for the latter half of the story, The Rolf Harris Show. Alongside these were the usual mixture of repeats and American imports, none of which held a massive triumph over Doctor Who, despite the Green Death's lower ratings when compared to the rest of Season 10. Also, during its broadcast, we were moving into British summertime, so with warmer weather and the sun staying out longer, less people were at their TVs for 5.50pm when Doctor Who was on air. The story again is another well-loved classic from the Pertwee era, even if it is playfully referred to as the one with the maggots. But if you look a little deeper, it's far more than just some maligned maggots. The Green Death is a fabulous tale all about how we take our Earth for granted, and when abused, the horrors that can arise from it, all with the little sprinkle of Doctor Who goodness. One of the most memorable scenes, of course, is Joe's eventual departure from the Doctor's side, which is beautifully built up and hinted at throughout the story's six episodes. Her departure was commented on by viewers of all ages, and the story as a whole serves as a fitting end and send-off to the bumbling, slightly clumsy companion we all know and love as Joe Grant. Overall, this story attracted an average of 7.7 .7 million viewers, a 2 million drop from the previous story. Sadly, this pits The Green Death as the least viewed story of the entire season. However, a 7.7 .7 million average is far from a poor showing, and it once again shows how loyal vast proportions of the viewership were to Doctor Who during John Pertwee's tenure. We also have a fair amount of repeat data for this story. Firstly, The Green Death was broadcast as a 90 minute compilation on the 27th of December 1973, and attracted a huge 10.4 million viewers. This was the third successful Christmas compilation in a row for Doctor Who, partly done to capitalise on the boosted festive audience, but also to promote an upcoming season. Although saying that, this edit went out between episodes 2 and 3 of the season 11 opener, The Time Warrior, which seems like an odd time to show a repeat. But, you know, hey ho, they did what they wanted to in the 70s. Our last lot of repeat data for The Green Death comes from BBC Two in the year 1994. Airing over six weeks from the 2nd of January to the 6th of February 1994, here are the viewing figures for this repeat, which came out with an average of 1.2 million viewers. This is quite surprising, even for this period of BBC Two repeats, as other stories around this time were gaining averages of around 2 or 3 million. Still, with increased competition and no new Who on screens, we can hardly bash it too much. The Green Death is a beautiful season finale with lots of action, captivating monsters, and one of the most heartfelt send-offs in the show's near 60-year history. To enjoy the story today, you can read the Target book from 1975, 
or its audio adaptation from 2008. To watch it, you have the VHS from 1996 and two DVD releases, the original from 2004 and the special edition re-release from 2013. You can also enjoy The Green Death on Blu-ray, thanks to the Season 10 collection set. You hardly need me to recommend this one to you, but if you haven't seen it, make it one of the first on your long list of Who binge watching. I promise you, you won't be disappointed. Oh, I nearly forgot. Your wedding present. It's beautiful. Thank you, Doctor. So that's season 10, the five stories that comprise it and the ratings that they garnered. With the transmission of episode 6 of The Green Death, season 10 was brought to an end, concluding a near seven month run comprised of 26 episodes across five stories. All 26 of those episodes exist today in the BBC archives, and only one of them had to undergo any kind of restoration in order for it to be presented in colour. This was episode 3 of Planet of the Daleks. For many years the episode only existed as a black and white film print. However, thanks to advancements in restoration technology, colour was able to be restored in time for the story's DVD release in 2009. The technique was chroma dot recovery, where colour information in black and white prints can be brought out and restored in a raw form. This, combined with some manual colorization to get shades and tones looking as accurate as possible, is how Planet of the Daleks Episode 3 was able to be seen in colour once again. Now let's have a look at the story averages for this season. We can see that the highest story average comes from the opener, The Three Doctors, with 10.3 million on average tuning in. It's not exactly a shock horror this story gained the most viewership, I mean, as discussed, having all three actors back for a big adventure is bound to pull even the most casual of viewers in. The lowest story average comes with the finale, The Green Death, which attained 7.7 .7 million viewers. This figure represents a 2.6 million drop across Season 10, but similar to Season 9, which had a similar gap between its highest and lowest, this is by no means a disaster. For The Green Death to average 7.7 .7 million is a positive step forward from the darker days of 60s Who, where stories such as The Smugglers, and even the war games were drawing in less than 5 million viewers on average. Now, as we always do, let's work out the overall average for this season. By combining the average ratings of each story, we can calculate that the average for season 10 of Doctor Who stands at around roughly 9 million viewers, one of the strongest season averages for the show thus far, second only to season 2, which averaged at 10.4 million. This 9 million average continues the upward trend of season averages for the Pertwee era of the show. Where season 7 began with a 7.2 million average, it's remarkable how in a few short years, Doctor Who had been transformed from a show narrowly avoiding the chopping block to being one of the BBC's most highly viewed and praised success stories. Season 10 not only continued Doctor Who's success in the 1970s, but arguably cemented it. It was undeniable that this show, one that had survived for 10 years, was now practically a national institution. The sights of the TARDIS, a Dalek, even the titular Doctor himself were now instantly recognisable to people up and down the country, for both children and adults. The stories of Season 10 also show how the programme is in no way getting stale or slowing down. The Doctor's freedom is restored, taking him back into time and space. It was a perfect mechanic to keep the show feeling fresh and alive with imagination. Whether it's the horrors of the miniscope, the perils on Draconia, or even battling the Daleks on Spyridon, all of it is gorgeously realised and the production team taking full advantage of the show being in a full colour glory. Most would say the teaming up of the three Doctors was the high point of this celebratory year, but for me I would argue it's eclipsed ever so slightly by the departure of Joe Grant in The Green Death. Katie Manning has always been instantly watchable and likeable as both a performer and as a person. Watching her say goodbye to the Doctor never fails to bring a tear to both my eyes or to the millions who grew to love her. A perfect end to an arguably near perfect season. In the last few months of 1973, Doctor Who officially crossed the 10th anniversary line, a feat that not many shows both back then or even today get to achieve. Season 10 had proved to be another peak for the show, both in terms of the quality of the stories being written, but also in viewer reactions, and perhaps most importantly for the BBC, the viewing figures. A very impressive sign that this 10-year-old show still had a lot of life left in it. However, as Season 11 approached, it would mark the end of quite a few things that made early 70s Who so successful, namely the departure of leading actor John Pertwee. 
whom after five years in the role, decided that it was finally time to move on. This would also mean the gradual retirement of the unit regulars, as well as key members of the production team, including producer Barry Letts and script editor Terence Dix. But with one last set of stories to create, the production team, undaunted by the immense success of the 10th anniversary, set about once again to craft new adventures throughout time and space. But with one last set of stories to create, the production team, undaunted by the immense success of the 10th anniversary, set about once again to craft new adventures throughout time and space for the Doctor to explore planets, meet new friends, and fight evil monsters along the way. So as we gear up to say goodbye to the Pertwee era, let's go through his final five stories, and see if they continued the rating success built up over the past four years. The first story from Season 11 is The Time Warrior. Investigating the disappearance of several scientists, the Doctor and journalist Sarah Jane Smith discover they are being abducted through time by the Sontaran warrior Lynx, who is stranded in medieval England. This story is comprised of four episodes, which began airing on the 15th of December 1973 and concluded on the 5th of January 1974. Here are the individual viewing figures for all four episodes, and whilst all numbers are decent, we seem to be a bit all over the place. The story starts with a strong 8.7 million tuning in for part 1, before diving to 7 million and then to 6.6 .6 over the next two weeks, before gaining a massive 4 million boost for the final part, which showed the story's peak at 10.6 million viewers. This is undoubtedly the most inconsistent the viewing figures have been for a Pertwee opener, but having said that, both parts 1 and 4 were able to make it into the top 40 TV programs for their respective weeks, part 1 coming in at 34th, and part 4 charting highest for the story, coming in at 22nd. So just what on earth contributed to these figures being so wildly sporadic? Well, it's not like people didn't know Doctor Who was coming back. The 10th anniversary of Doctor Who had happened a few weeks before the Time Warriors transmission, and as such, numerous stars of the show, past and present, popped up on various news programs as well as children's shows like Blue Peter to celebrate the milestone and discuss the upcoming season 11. The Radio Times, then still a powerful promotional tool for any program, went ahead and gave Doctor Who the prestigious front cover for a fifth year in a row, meaning that all of Pertwee's season openers got some sort of coverage on the magazine, a feat never to be repeated in the classic era. As always, we have to ask, what was the competition up to over at ITV? Were they airing anything through the Time Warriors broadcast that was contributing to the ratings divide in the middle? Well, despite the regionalised structure of ITV at the time, for three out of the four weeks that the show was on, it was mainly facing off against one programme rather than several. Part 2 went out against Sale of the Century, which, if you watch this series, you'll know has a history of negatively impacting on Doctor Who's viewing figures. Parts 1 and 3 went against a talent show, New Faces, which was exceedingly popular at the time, and it could have contributed, particularly to Part 3's lower ratings of 6.6 .6 million. For Part 4, several different programmes aired in several different regions, but these were mainly repeats of American shows, such as Kung Fu, Candid Camera, and The Partridge Family, competition which didn't seem to bother the Time Warrior too much that week, as that was when we saw the peak rise to 10.6 million. This story also marks the first appearance of the Sontaran warrior race. We are introduced to the sinister Lynx, a warrior operating solo, utilising tech from the present to influence the past. While some commenters joke at the rather baked potato look of the creature, something that still gets bandied about today, Lynx is both an intimidating and formidable opponent for the Doctor to face. I would argue it's not the greatest Sontaran story to have aired, but as an introduction, it works rather well. I mean, after 10 seasons, Lynx finally asked the most obvious question people had had on their minds for a decade, and it actually gets an answer. What is your native planet? Gallifrey. I am a Time Lord. Ah, yes. That's right, we learned from a very quick line that the Doctor is from the planet Gallifrey. And that's all the knowledge we get for now, but trust me, lots of Gallifrey is going to be coming up over the next few years of the show. Overall, this story attracted an average of 8.2 million viewers. This is sadly a 2.1 million decrease from Season 10's opener, The Three Doctors, but you have to cut it some slack. The Three Doctors gimmick was bound to pull in those extra viewers. A baked potato man? Maybe not so much. However, this is far from a poor showing, and it actually matches the average gained by the very first John Pertwee story, Spearhead from Space, which aired four years prior. Whilst it may not have kicked off Season 11 with the 10 million plus figures the BBC could have been hoping for, The Time Warrior still serves as a great introductory tale for not only the Sontarans, but arguably the most beloved classic Who companion, Sarah Jane Smith, played brilliantly by Elizabeth Sladen. 
a plucky journalist, Sladen's combination of wit, charm and warmth makes Sarah an instantly likeable character to the audience. It's a great result, especially after Katie Manning's departure as Joe broke so many hearts six months earlier. Introducing a new companion, and one whom audiences would take to in a similar vein, was essential, and an aspect in which Elizabeth delivers right from the get-go, and would continue to deliver her brilliance for nearly the next 40 years. To enjoy The Time Warrior today, in the written form you have the Target book from 1978, and its audiobook adaptation from 2008. To watch it you have a VHS release from 1989, or via a DVD that was released in 2007. It may not be one of my favourites amongst the list of Stella Pertwee stories, but to introduce the Sontarans and Sarah Jane, whilst delivering a rare historical outing for the Third Doctor, all has helped the Time Warrior become an enduring classic to many a Whovian. Give it a watch if you get the chance. Brigadier, a straight line may be the shortest distance between two points, but it is by no means the most interesting. Goodbye, old chap. The second story from Season 11 is Invasion of the Dinosaurs. When the Doctor and Sarah return to London, they find it deserted, with prehistoric monsters roaming the streets. A group of idealistic fanatics are determined to obliterate history in their quest for a new golden age. This story is comprised of six episodes, which began airing on the 12th of January 1974 and concluded on the 16th of February. Here are the individual viewing figures for all six episodes and wow, this is certainly a big jump up that I wasn't expecting. The first three parts all soar above 10 million viewers, the peak being a tie between parts 1 and 3, which both pulled in 11 million viewers. However, with the last three parts we see that there's quite a drop. Gone are the 10 million plus, with parts 4 and 5 pulling in 9 million, and part 6 attaining the story's lowest rating with 7.5 million watching. The numbers for the last three parts, whilst lower, are hardly terrible, and in terms of performance the first five parts all placed within the top 40 programs, the winner being part 5, which placed 23rd despite having 2 million less viewers than when the story began. So even though there was a very strong start, what caused Invasion of the Dinosaurs to lose a big chunk of viewership halfway through? Well, outside of normal competition and promotional factors, there was something bigger going on in the UK at the time of Invasion of the Dinosaurs broadcast. As Prime Minister, I want to speak to you simply and plainly about the grave emergency now facing our country. We are limiting the use of electricity by almost all factories, shops and offices to three days a week. In early 1974, the government imposed a three-day week, meaning that electricity consumption was being restricted to all sectors, and one of them of course was television. The BBC and ITV were forced to shut down at 10.30pm each night in order to conserve power, but oddly enough this didn't seem to have hindered Doctor Who at all. The restrictions were lifted for the BBC on the 8th of February, one day before Part 5, due to an upcoming last minute general election. But for Parts 1 to 4, all going out despite these restrictions, if anything more homes were watching than ever before, so I don't think the 3 day week negatively impacted Doctor Who, despite a similar power dispute causing the show to lose ratings happened only two years previously, due to a miners strike. A miners strike did happen again in 1974 at this time, but it seems that even though homes lost power sporadically, a lot of homes were still tuning in. Back in the regular factors of promotion and competition, Invasion of the Dinosaurs shone in both categories. The story received some really lavish artwork in the Radio Times, and John Pertwee appeared on Blue Peter, armed with his latest vehicle, the Hoomobile, which would be seen for the first time in the story. In terms of competition, ITV decided its main contender against Doctor Who would be a variety show hosted by Rolf Harris. This wasn't the case in all regions, and some of the smaller ones opted for programs that we saw go up against the Time Warrior some weeks prior. None of them seemed to greatly affect the story. I mean, none of them had dinosaurs or a Hoomobile, so that's something to bear in mind. However, despite strong promotion for the serial and relatively weak competition, two announcements came during Dinosaur's broadcast that would shock the world of Who fandom. The day before Part 5 went out, it was announced that John Pertwee would be leaving Doctor Who after five seasons, at that time becoming the longest serving actor in the lead role. His decision to leave hardly comes as a surprise. With the death of his close friend Roger Delgado and the departure of his long-standing companion Katie Manning, the family element Pertwee had enjoyed in his first few years simply wasn't there anymore, and it was time to move on to pastures new. Whilst many were shocked, as some fans had only ever known Pertwee as the Time Lord, viewers didn't have time to think about it for long, as exactly one week later, on the 15th of February 1974, Tom Baker was revealed to be the fourth actor to take on the role of the Doctor, to debut at the end of the year. 
Baker was known by British audiences for his roles in movies, and in some TV shows too, but little did we know what was to come from him once he had hold of the TARDIS keys. But more on that when we get there. Overall, this story attracted an average of 9.6 million viewers, a nice 1.4 increase from the previous story. I would say this is a showing of what strong promotion and strong story elements can achieve. The inclusion of ever-popular dinosaurs, a new vehicle for the Doctor, the unit regulars, all of which I would argue help give this story its boost on initial transmission. The 9.6 million figure also makes it one of the most viewed Pertwee stories of the entire era. In today's standing, Invasion of the Dinosaurs is often sadly laughed at. Sure, the dinosaur effects are arguably far from convincing, but this was a TV show in 1974 with a very small budget trying to implement effects on a Hollywood-esque level. The importance is in the story, and being the last script from legendary writer Malcolm Hulk. It's another home run. There's many a touching and poignant moment within this serial too, whether it's between the unit regulars or with the Doctor Stark warning to the Brigadier at the end, Invasion of the Dinosaurs is a story that takes itself seriously, regardless of any wobbly effects. If you want to give it a second chance or to see it for the first time, you can read the Target book from 1976 and its audiobook adaptation from 2007, both titled as Doctor Who and the Dinosaur Invasion. In terms of watching it, it was one of the last stories to be released on VHS in 2003 and it was released on DVD in 2012 as part of the Unit Files box set. Invasion of the Dinosaurs may not be the most well-realised Doctor Who story of all time, but it's one brimming with imagination, many a strong action moment and a cast of regulars giving their A-game, treating the situation with a level of seriousness that helps make this feel less corny than it should. It's absolutely worth a watch in my view, and for those of you who haven't seen it in a while, give it another chance, hopefully you won't be too disappointed. It's not the, the oil and the filth and the poisonous chemicals that are the real cause of pollution, Brigadier. It's simply greed. The third story from Season 11 is Death to the Daleks. A power drain strands the TARDIS on the desolate planet Exelon. The Doctor and Sarah join a human expedition who are in search of Perinium, a rare mineral that could save millions of lives. But the Daleks arrive and want the Perinium for themselves. This story is comprised of four episodes, which began airing on the 23rd of February 1974 and concluded on the 16th of March. Here are the individual viewing figures for all four episodes, and these are some pretty strong numbers overall I would say. The peak of the story crosses that 10 million barrier once again, with part 3 claiming 10.5 million viewers. Even the lowest viewed episode, part 1, brought in 8.1 million, which in comparison is more than most individual episodes of the Patrick Troughton era, so even not reaching the heights achieved by stories in season 10, this is far from a failure. In terms of the top 40 programs, parts 2 to 4 found their spot within that chart part 3 being victorious, coming in at 20th place. So what was it about Death to the Daleks that helped retain and in places increase Doctor Who's viewership? Well, the Daleks themselves continued to be a dominant force in terms of gaining ratings for the programme. Having appeared in the last two seasons, older viewers were happy seeing the classic favourites from the black and white era reimagined for the 1970s, whereas newer viewers had gotten the chance to experience the Pepper Potts for the very first time and finding them just as menacing and captivating as people did back in the 60s. Despite Death to the Daleks arguably having the least promotion out of the Pertwee Dalek tales, the numbers we saw earlier showed that the impact of featuring the monsters was still very much valid. In terms of competition over at ITV, for most regions it was the same programs that went up against the Time Warrior and Invasion of the Dinosaurs. There was one new contender, Reg Varney, but again, not even he could spell disaster for Doctor Who. In terms of the story itself, Death to the Daleks is either affectionately loved by fans or derided as a piece of absolute drivel. In my view, whilst it isn't my favourite Dalek story, I still find it has a lot of elements that are enjoyable today, and that silver trim the Daleks have is quite appealing to the eye. Even at the time of broadcast back in 1974, this story was receiving positive praise from members of the BBC's Programme Review Board. Director of Programmes, Alice Dare Milne, claimed that he had found it an exceptionally frightening adventure. And I mean, can you blame him? Look at this. You tell me this isn't frightening, I dare you. Overall, this story attracted an average of 9.4 million viewers, a 0.2 drop from the previous story. This makes it a third successive Dalek adventure from the Pertwee era to bring in a figure above 9 million with Day of the Daleks having 9.6, 
and Planet of the Daleks pipping it with 9.7. This average, if anything, proved that not only were the Daleks still popular, but Doctor Who's popularity as a whole, and audience loyalty, was holding, if not growing, inch by inch. After nearly five years, viewers had not only warmed to John Pertwee's Doctor, but for many had accepted him as the definitive Doctor, and having faced the Daleks now not once, not twice, but three times, it was a claim that many at the time found hard to ignore. To enjoy Death to the Daleks today, you can read the Target book from 1978, or its audio adaptation from 2016. To watch it, you have two VHS releases, a compilation edition from 1987, and an unedited, episodic version from 1995. Alternatively, you can also watch it on DVD, thanks to a release from 2012. Whether you like Death to the Daleks or not, you can't deny that it's a very watchable adventure. The Exelon world is fascinating, and the Daleks are back to being a bit more cunning and manipulative when forced to ally with the humans, and there is many a notable and quotable moment. Such as this, how could you forget the most iconic Doctor Who cliffhanger of all time? Stop, don't move. The fourth and penultimate story from Season 11 is The Monster of Peladon. The Doctor makes a return trip to the planet Peladon. Now a member of the Galactic Federation, Peladon is a source of Trisilicate, which is essential in the war with Galaxy 5, but mining is being disrupted by apparitions of Peladon's sacred beast, Agador. This story is comprised of six episodes, which began airing on the 23rd of March 1974 and concluded on the 27th of April. Here are the individual viewing figures for all six episodes, and oof, we seem to be facing quite a dip here. Part 1 starts out strong, and in the vein of the previous few stories, with 9.2 million viewers tuning in. However, with Part 2, over 2 million viewers were lost, bringing in this story's weakest point of 6.8 million. Over the next four weeks, the numbers do build back up, mostly coming in within the 7 million range, before Part 6 goes one further, pulling in 8.1 million viewers. In terms of the top 40 programs, Parts 1, 4, and 6 all charted, Part 1 placing the highest at 23rd. So, despite a strong start and finish, what caused numbers to dip so drastically so early on in the story's run? Well, promotion was pretty lacklustre, with the Monster of Peladon only receiving small pieces of artwork in the Radio Times to promote each episode in its corresponding week. There was no special TV trailer either, but in fairness, there didn't seem to be much of that extra leg of promotion for Season 11 as a whole. Perhaps the BBC, or whoever was in charge of promotion, felt that with this bumper success of Season 10 and the numbers it drew in, that maybe Doctor Who had become one of those programmes that sells itself, so to speak. But if promotion wasn't a factor, then competition certainly could have been. For Parts 1 and 2, most ITV regions were screening the Reg Varney review, whilst others showed off Candid Camera. However, from Part 3 onwards, most regions decided to carry talent show new faces, which was very popular. Having said that, for Doctor Who to still be consistently bringing in 7 million viewers against such popular opposition is certainly commendable. Or, on a purely theoretical level, perhaps viewers just didn't take to this story after Part 1 went out. Despite being a pseudo-sequel to Season 9's The Curse of Peladon, as mentioned, the promotional run for this story didn't really seem to focus on that. When it comes to the monster of Peladon and the drop in viewing figures, on this occasion I think it's fair to say it could have been a combination of many factors. But it is nice to see that by the story's end, the programme had regained over half of that initial 2 million drop. The story itself is often overlooked when compared to its predecessor two years earlier, and whilst yes, it arguably is a bit too long at six parts instead of Curse's four, it still does provide a lot of substance for the viewer. Just as Curse had drawn parallels to the UK joining the EU, Monster draws on the striking action at the time of the miners, who for many years in the 70s were at a constant battle with the establishment for better wages for the work they were carrying out. The Ice Warriors return too, back to a more villainous role, but it's nice to see them be threatening again, as this would actually turn out to be their last on-screen appearance for nearly 40 years. Overall, this story attracted an average of 7.7 .7 million viewers, a 1.7 million drop from the previous story. This is quite a staggering decline at first glance, but as I've mentioned across the past few episodes of the series, to attain an average like that across a six-week adventure, going up against strong competition no less, is downright impressive. The Monster of Peladon may be derided as being one of the most forgettable stories of the Pertwee era, but I would defend it and say it's worth a second look. To experience that second look, you can read the Target book from 1980, or its audiobook adaptation from 2020. To watch it, you have the VHS release from 1995, or the DVD release from 2010 as part of the Peladon Tales box set. 
It's rare in the classic era of Doctor Who for sequel stories to be attempted, let alone with the same Doctor. So to see the monster of Peladon pick up where Curse left off, and continue to expand on that world, its cultures and its problems, is an absolute joy to watch. The return of the Ice Warriors in a more monster-esque role is a treat for those who love their escapades in the 60s, and the bond between the Third Doctor and Sarah only continues to strengthen. And it's a pity in a way, as this would be the penultimate story featuring the duo. For John Pertwee, for his Doctor, his time was about to come. The fifth and final story from Season 11 is Planet of the Spiders. Reaching out across space and time, the giant spiders of Metabilis III are searching for a rare blue crystal, previously stolen from their world by the Doctor. Determined to thwart the spider's plans, the Doctor must ultimately face his greatest fear. This story is comprised of six episodes, which began airing on the 4th of May 1974 and concluded on the 8th of June. Here are the individual viewing figures for all six episodes, and it's nice to see that the numbers are looking nice and strong as the Pertwee era closes out. Part 1 provides one last break into the 10 million range, and with the lowest figure being Part 4's 8.2 million, it's clear that the majority of the audience were here to stay and see out the last adventure for the Third Doctor. For the top 40 TV programmes, all six parts chart comfortably, with Part 1 placing highest at 17th. So how did Planet of the Spiders achieve such a consistent showing to close out the John Pertwee years? Well, in terms of promotion, there was surprisingly not that much of it for the actual story itself. You had the usual pieces of artwork in the Radio Times listings, but there was no front cover, no special trailer. However, you could argue that Planet of the Spiders promoted itself, or rather a specific aspect of itself, months prior. The specific aspect being the departure of John Pertwee. When looking up or referencing this story at the time, the prevailing line to describe it is the fact that this is the third Doctor's swan song, and to be fair, that's probably all this story needed to pull in a vast chunk of its audience. For anyone who even casually watched Doctor Who during the Pertwee years, it would have arguably had a passing interest in seeing how the character was to bow out. But with this TV event upcoming, did competition at ITV attempt to seriously prepare to fight it? The short answer is, not really. Most regions were showing stuff that had been consistently battling Season 11, namely the talent show New Faces. Also keep in mind, Planet of the Spiders was going out in May and June, a transition period leading into British summertime. A time frame that even in 1974 still often resulted in less people on average tuning into their favourite programmes. In short though, Planet of the Spiders was far more than just a regular season finale at the time of its broadcast. This was the end of an era of colossal success for Doctor Who, going from near cancellation in 1969 to testing the waters with a big shake-up in 1970 all the way up to 1974, where episodes of the show were consistently bringing in 8, 9, even over 10 million viewers week after week. As a story itself, I would argue Planet of the Spiders is far from perfect, but it's a summary of everything the show stood for and had achieved over the past few years. There's one last hurrah for the unit regulars, alongside their most familiar Doctor. Part 2 is a love letter to this era's love of vehicles and gadgetry, and John Pertwee gives one last stellar performance, proving that whilst his Doctor may be a bit sterner and more authoritative, he is still willing to do what it takes to make things right, and to protect those he cares for. Absolutely splendid. Overall, this story attracted an average of 9 million viewers, a 1.3 million increase from the previous story. Whilst the averages for Season 11 stories have jumped up and down a bit, it's reassuring to see that for the Third Doctor's last battle, he came out with one of the strongest averages of his era. 9 million viewers on average tuned in to see him fight against the giant spiders. That's 3.4 million more than those who tuned in to see him escape a parallel world in Inferno only four years earlier. A testament to how this period of the show gradually became a roaring success across its five seasons. We also have some repeat data for you. On the 27th of December 1974, it was decided that Planet of the Spiders would be that year's Christmas time omnibus repeat, a practice that had begun in 1971 with a repeat of The Demons, and one that had proved to be an enormous rating success for three years running. However, Planet of the Spiders was chosen arguably for a more significant purpose. As the very next day, the 28th of December, would mark the transmission of Part 1 of Robot, the very first story for the newly regenerated Fourth Doctor. So to repeat the final adventure of the preceding Doctor the day before the arrival of the new one, that's some good marketing if you ask me. Here are the viewing figures for this compilation repeat, 
and whilst not being the highest of these re-airings, 8.6 million is still a very strong figure, especially for a repeat. But you no longer have to wait for repeats, as if you wish to enjoy Planet of the Spiders today, you can read it via the Target book from 1975, or its audio adaptation from 2009. To watch it, you have the VHS release from 1991, or as a standalone DVD from 2011. If you're a fan of the Earthbound formula of the Pertwee years, the Planet of the Spiders couldn't be a better swan song for you to enjoy. Whilst there are jumps off world too, it's a nice blending of what this era started. Rooted firmly at Earth and with Unit, and with the Doctor's freedom being restored, and his jaunts off world becoming more of a regular occurrence again. I feel it may be a tad too long, but it's no less entertaining, and provides a very fitting and heroic end to arguably the suavest, most action-packed Doctor yet. Look, Brigadier, look! I think it's starting. Well, here we go again. So that's Season 11, the five stories that comprise it, and the ratings that they garnered. With the transmission of Episode 6 of Planet of the Spiders, Season 11 was brought to an end, concluding a near six-month run, comprised of 26 episodes across five stories. All 26 of those episodes still exist today in the BBC archives, and only one of them had to undergo any kind of colour recovery, this being Part 1 of Invasion of the Dinosaurs. One method in which colour had been restored to John Pertwee episodes was via the process of chroma dot recovery. This technique was used on stories such as The Mind of Evil and Planet of the Daleks. However, with this episode of Invasion of the Dinosaurs, whilst the red and green colour signals were present, the blue signal was not. So, when this story was being prepared for a DVD release, a mix of chroma dot recovery and manual colorization was pursued, to try and achieve the best result possible. And whilst the result isn't up to DVD standard, it is presented as an optional extra, the high quality black and white version being the default. To learn about the process of chroma dot recovery, and the fascinating history behind how many Pertwee stories came back to the archives, then I recommend watching the fantastic documentary made by Josh Schnares. He explains it much better than I ever could, that's for sure. Now let's take a look at the story averages for this season. We're breaking traditions here, as the highest average doesn't come from the season opener, but instead comes from Invasion of the Dinosaurs, with a 9.6 million figure. The lowest point comes with the Monster of Peladon, which pulled in 7.7 .7 million on average. Whilst these numbers may seem a bit erratic, I would argue they're still very healthy and commendable, especially for a show that by 1974 had been running for nearly 11 years. As mentioned, these viewing figures are truly a testament to how adaptable and different Doctor Who can be, whilst building up on factors that have clicked with audiences, and continuing to push the boundaries in televisual storytelling. Now, as we always do, let's work out the overall average for this season. By combining the average ratings of each story, we can calculate that the average for Season 11 of Doctor Who stands at around roughly 8.8 .8 million viewers. It's not the highest season average we've encountered on our journey, but it only falls behind Season 2's 10.4 million and Season 10's 9 million, so a bronze medal for now is very commendable indeed. Let's have a look at how Season 11 did when compared to the rest of the Pertwee era. As you can see, it actually ranks the second highest of the season averages, just behind Season 10. Further testament to how the audience numbers not only grew during the 1970s, but also how they stayed, how they were captivated, and how they were intrigued to see what adventures awaited the Doctor next. But now, as we've reached the end of another Doctor's era, it's time we got really nerdy with numbers and figure out the overall average for the Pertwee years. By combining the results achieved from seasons 7 through 11, we can calculate that the average viewing figures for the John Pertwee era of Doctor Who stand at around roughly 8.3 million viewers. This means that the Pertwee era is the most viewed on average thus far, pipping the Hartnell era by 0.4 million and the Troughton era by 1.2 million. Whilst Hartnell may have had several stories average over 10 million, Pertwee's era is more successful as a whole because the numbers were arguably far more consistent. Think about it, of the 24 John Pertwee stories that were broadcast on TV, only one story gained an average of less than 7 million viewers, that being the season 7 finale, Inferno. Compare that to the 29 William Hartnell stories, and you'll find that 11 of them average less than 7 million. So, of the three eras we've covered so far, the John Pertwee years take the crown not only for being the most viewed on average, but also for being the most continuously strong and consistent. Season 11 was a culmination of everything that made the John Pertwee era of Doctor Who a roaring success for the 70s. 
building off the newfound freedom to travel space and time that was established in Season 10, these last few stories for the Third Doctor don't forget to give the audience a balanced mix. You have the escapade into the past with the Time Warrior, off-world encounters with classic monsters, but also a good dose of the Earthbound unit stories, Invasion of the Dinosaurs being a bit more traditional, whereas Planet of the Spiders feels like everything was crammed in to give the Third Doctor the best send-off possible. John Pertwee undoubtedly redefined the role for the show's launch into colour, and completely made it his own. He was cool, he was suave, he was authoritative, but also very caring and compassionate. He stood for what was right, and he was never cruel, and he was never cowardly. For millions of viewers, he was their definitive Doctor Who. And for many millions, he continued to be. Despite achieving massive success as children's icon Wurzel Gummidge, John was never shy in taking up the role again on several occasions whether it was for conventions, for commercials, even appearing on TV once again as part of the 20th anniversary story, The Five Doctors. He would embrace Doctor Who all the way up until his sad passing in 1996. He was 77 years old. But things don't last forever, and as he collapsed to the floor of the unit lab, the third Doctor was gone, and the fourth Doctor, played by the curly-haired Tom Baker, was now in his place. It would be six months before viewers could see this new Doctor in action, and with season 12 going before the cameras, a new batch of stories were being crafted, some of which would go on to be some of the most iconic adventures in the show's long history. But would this new era continue the success established in the Pertwee years? Would it reach new heights, or would it crash and burn? You'll have to join me next time to find out the answer to that one. Goodbye. So those are the ratings details for the entire John Pertwee era of Doctor Who. I hope you enjoyed this numerical look back at the first half of the 70s, and just how Doctor Who was able to reinvent itself, not only just in colour, but with a new format, many new monsters, and an incredible nemesis that would go on for years to come. If you particularly enjoy this era of Doctor Who, I highly recommend a bunch of videos from several great Who-based creators, including Josh Schneers, Davis, Darlan Reviews, and Cynical Who. If you want to read more about Doctor Who in the making of it, I highly recommend the Complete History series of books, which I used as reference for this video. If you want to keep up to date with this series, you can by following me on Twitter and Instagram, and if you want to see new episodes of the series early, then you can by supporting us over on the AMTV Patreon. Please consider leaving us a like, subscribing to the channel, and leaving your thoughts on Season 11 in the comments section below. I've been Adam Martin from AMTV, and I'll see you next time for the Tom Baker years. <laughs>